My new year resolution in 2012 was to get in shape again. After my first kid was born, I'd lost my athletic interest, but I had every intention of getting it back. So I started running four days a week with my friend Hannah, who was a great runner and motivator. We would run after work, usually five to 10 kilometers, usually favoring the forest trail. It's the kind of trail that has lighting in the darker months of the year, so you can run there anytime really. Once you turn on the lights, you have 45 minutes to run the shorter trails and the longer to run the longer ones. Then the lights shut off automatically. We'd been running for about two months when we started to see the same man hanging out around the parking lot every single time we got there. He was thin, maybe 25 to 30 years of age, always dressed in sports clothes but never actually running. He never looked at us in the eye either. We just speculated that he could be homeless and camping nearby just because he was constantly there. We got used to seeing him, sitting somewhere close by silently, always on his own. We felt sorry for him. He never seemed to talk to anyone or interact with anyone at all, but there was something about him that made us hesitate to talk to him or ask if he was okay. I can't pinpoint what it was, but something wasn't completely right with him. One evening, Hannah didn't make it to our run and I decided to go on my own. I arrive at the parking lot, my car being the only car there. I did some stretching, turned the lights on, and set off on the five kilometer trail. I hadn't seen the thin silent man when I started my run. Perhaps it was getting too cold to sit there now that it was autumn, dark, and getting close to the freezing point. He must have been there though, somewhere in the shadows. Because when I got to the top of the first steep hill, I could hear heavy breathing somewhere behind me. I look over my shoulder and see him. He's running like a man obsessed, in regular shoes, not running shoes, with his arms moving in a really strange stiff manner, as if he was made of metal, like his hands were arrows, straight and in an upward inward angle, sort of like a sprinter but more extreme, more robotic. For the first time ever, he looked at me straight in the eye, and it was definitely the eyes of a predatory animal, and it made my heart freeze. He'd never done anything to harm me or anyone else as far as I knew, but the look in his eyes alone was enough to let me know that I was facing a serious, serious threat. I started running even faster, trying to create distance between us. I could still hear his heavy breathing getting more and more strained. I ran like my life depended on it, adrenaline pumping through my body and giving me renewed strength. I tore off my necklace and threw it on the ground, thinking I must leave a trace if he takes me. Something must be left behind. I tried screaming, hoping someone would be close enough to hear me, but I wasn't able to scream my lungs out and keep up the pace at the same time. Why is he doing this? What does he want? Who is this guy? I thought. As I started to feel my lungs burn. Then I thought of my 15 month year old daughter and ran until I could taste blood in my mouth. It was still behind me, maybe a hundred meters, but now I figured that if I trip and fall, or run out of energy, or even fumble with the car keys, once I reach the parking lot, I'm screwed. So once I reached the sharp turn on the trail, I went off the trail and ran straight into the dark woods. I only ran a short distance, then laid myself down flat on my stomach, hands searching for a rock to defend myself with if he found me. I realized that I was wearing bright running clothes with reflexes and neon coloring. I've never felt so visible in the dark before now. I could hear him reach the turn, and thank God he kept on running. I started as slowly and as silently as possible, moved further and further into the darkness. My heart sank again as soon as I heard rapid footsteps closing in from the trail. He had realized that I must have gone off the trail once he saw that there was no sign of me ahead of him. He stopped, and I stopped. I could imagine him listening for any sound. I held my breath and begged to a god I don't believe in to make him go away. After a while, I hear him say something in a language that I didn't recognize, and then walk off. I didn't move. I feared that he would wait for me by my car and realize that I'd gone off the trail and onto the main road and just try and stop someone. I could not go back to the parking lot. I started to make my way further into the woods, knowing that I would eventually end up on the last part of the long tail and close to the main road. The lights on the trail suddenly shut off. 
It made me calmer at first. The dark was comfort and sort of a protection. But then, after only a few moments, it switched on again. This could mean another person had started their run, and I soon would have someone there to help me. Or, he was now looking for me and getting ready to prey on another lonely runner. I decided against waiting it out and continued my way towards the main road. It was dark and I fell multiple times, my clothes getting wet from the damp vegetation and I began to get cold. After what felt like a lifetime, I could see the 10 kilometer trail ahead and I knew I was now close to the main road and soon I could hear traffic. Once I made it to the road, I must have looked like I'd been in a terrible accident. Blood from several cuts from the falling. My clothes were dirty, and my face, I presume, was petrified. My bright running shorts soon attracted the attention of a passing car. My waving and desperate shouting made it stop. The driver, a 40-ish man with two kids in the back seat, spent the next 10 minutes or so trying to make sense of what I tried to say in between the sobbing and crying. He asked if I wanted to lift back to the parking lot. I told him no, please just take me home instead. At home, my husband insisted on going back to the parking lot to retrieve the car and call the police. To report what, I asked. No crime had been committed, but I knew he was trying to get me. My husband ended up going back for the car. The driver's seat window was smashed and my phone was gone. So was the photo of my daughter that I had hanging from my mirror. I don't know what he was trying to do, or why he even chased me the way he did. That look, that look in his eyes, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that he had bad intentions. So about five years ago, I, a 26-year-old male, set out to travel the world. Being straight out of college had left me in a debt, even more desperate for any job that I was overqualified for and just generally depressed. I felt isolated and alone in my small town in Washington and found the only way to get out was to travel. My high school friend suggested that I look into woofing and volunteering as a way for cheap travel. So I did just that. The way it works is quite simple. You work for around 25 hours a week on some farm for food and housing. The draw is that since the community of cheap ass travelers is quite big, it's a great way to meet new people, get outside of your comfort zone and just let yourself live and figure life out. Fast forward eight months, I'm a seasoned cow shit shoveler. Start out in Washington, then go to Oregon and went south to California. There, I was able to save some money that I was paid under the table for some extra work and was now faced with a decision. Where do I go in the world? The excitement of being able to purchase a ticket to almost anywhere in the world got the best of me and on the advice of my hippie volunteering partner, chose it at random. I went to a randomizer website, clicked on the country button, it landed on Georgia, the country of Georgia. To say I didn't know anything about it was an understatement, but the fear of the unknown made it exciting and exotic somehow, so I did it. I purchased a ticket and started browsing for a farm that would host me. There were few options, and most were remote, without even an internet connection. I messaged every single one, because few ever respond. I got a response from one farm on top of a mountain. The pictures showed a traditional Georgian stone house with large garden out in the back, a family with several cheerful children, grandparents having dinner, animals. It seemed warm and inviting. The description was written in good English and the requirements for work seemed very reasonable. I was excited. After I flew into Tbilisi, the capital, I followed the directions that they sent me to locate the farm, which wasn't an easy task. Very few in Georgia speak English. The roads are awful since very few have been maintained since the fall of the Soviet Union. The country is very generally poor. It took me around 20 hours of Soviet buses and taxis, weird serpentine roads, 
and paths that get to the desired blue pin on that map. It was a dirt path leaving up a steep hill into a national park up in the north of the country. There's nothing for miles on end but trees and there's silence. As I got up the hill, I saw the house about a half a mile away on an even steeper hill, surrounded by trees. From that point, it seemed abandoned. It was overgrown, brown and dreary. As I walked past the gate, Geary, the apparent owner, approached me. He was a heavy, small, middle-aged guy with a big smile on his face. He shook my hand and, in broken English, started to show me around. He definitely reeked of booze. As he was showing me around, I noticed there wasn't anyone there but us. I asked about his wife and kids, and he brushed it aside and said something to the extent, They're away right now. At this point, I'm kind of creeped out. From browsing around, it was apparent that the farm was in deep decline. Apple trees and crops were dying. The roof of the small barn had caved in. The house itself was full of trash and smelled of mold. It was obvious that Geary was going through a rough patch, but I wasn't going to turn around and just leave in the middle of nowhere and not having slept for the past 36 hours. It was now evening, and after feeding me well and trying as best as he could to hold a conversation in English, Geary showed me my room on the second floor and I went to sleep. I almost immediately blacked out from the exhaustion and stress and I would have slept for 10 hours if I wasn't awoken by some strange noise in the middle of the night. It sounded like something metallic and heavy was being dragged across the wooden floor. In that sleepy in-between state, I listened for a few moments, thought nothing of it, and tried to go back to sleep once it stopped. In the morning, Geary was now sober and grumpy. He asked me to repair some of the windows and the doors in the house as he himself planned to go and fetch some components in a nearby village. Again, I got this weird, creepy feeling down my spine. Something wasn't right. He didn't maintain eye contact, was very evasive. There's no cell reception and no internet. Once he left, I checked around the house to get a general idea of the place, and it became apparent that this place was hardly ever lived in, like one of those abandoned houses. There's broken furniture, newspapers, old photos on the floor, a shattered mirror. I took my phone and looked through the saved listing again. The photos I had didn't match the backyard, the garden, or walls. And Geary wasn't in any of them. This was a completely different house. Now by this point, I'm full-blown panicking. I packed up my stuff and started to leave when I saw a group of three men going up that first hill. There aren't any other paths I can take so I go behind the house and rush down the hill into the forest. After some time, I stop and listen. I hear them in the house. They're clearly looking for me, afraid of making any noise. I remain completely still, hidden behind a bush. I don't know how long I waited, but they were obviously persistent. At some point, I hear them leave, so I count until some large number, and then proceed back into the house and path. Once I find it's all clear, I book the hell out of there. Never ran that fast before, but I'm still in the middle of nowhere. No traffic, no public transport. I reach a paved road and just start walking in the general direction from where I remember coming from. Hours go by, but finally, a car drives by and stops. Now in a horror movie, this would have been Geary and his friends. But this was actually a really nice Russian family that gave me a ride into town. The listing disappeared from the website in a few days after I left, and I haven't heard from Geary since. I've yet to make sense of that experience. I've traveled more since, and volunteered too. Some people, once they hear this story, laugh and say that guy was coming over with a couple of friends from the village just to have a chat over a few beers. Some say he was bound to kidnap and kill me but I myself trust my gut feeling. Something was definitely not right. So to Geary, let's never ever meet again. This took place over a year ago and I'm still shaken up about this whole event. And I thought I'd share my story with you. 
I live in the UK, and in the fall, it gets dark around 4 p.m. There was a school autumn break that week, so all the kids were at home. So that means my girlfriend's brother was home too. I'd been with her for about a year at that point, so her family knew me pretty well, and her brother enjoyed my company. She'd recently been pretty stressed out. Her parents were going across the country for a day, so she had me look after her brother. But I thought that I'd give her a day to herself so she can just cool off. So I asked her parents if I could look after their son for the day, and they agreed. So I came over around 8 a.m. They let me in before they set off. My girlfriend's brother woke up about an hour later, and she followed shortly afterward. We went out for breakfast at a local cafe together, and went back to the house when we were done. Once I dropped her off, I took her brother to the park. We get there about 2 p.m., and the place was pretty packed. Eventually, the sun started going down and the place was completely empty by 4. I texted my girlfriend and told her we'd be home in a bit. She said okay. I'm going to be honest, I completely lost track of time. Me and her brother were having fun being the only two at the park. So, her brother and I stood on this really top, tall climbing fence with a slide on it. It was almost pitch black at this point, so I was using my phone as a flashlight. A notification popped up on my screen. It was my girlfriend asking where we were. I responded to her saying, Oops, uh, coming home now. And told her brother that we needed to go. He sighed and asked if we could go down the slides. And I responded yes. Before I went down, I knew what the park looked like. There were street lights all around it. Benches everywhere and some trees. And places for the kids to play. When I came out the slide... There was something weird. A man had appeared out of nowhere and stood beneath one of the street lights. He had a trench coat on and a beanie hat. I immediately got my girlfriend's brother behind me and called out to the man with a friendly, Hey there. I got a response. He started groaning. Yeah, I don't know. I noticed he was swaying back and forth in the light. He had his mouth open, was drooling, and had this blank look in his eyes man made me feel really, really uneasy. I picked her little brother up and kept checking on this guy the entire time. There was an exit to my left that led to the path back home, so we left out that way. I kept checking behind me every few seconds, and that man was still standing there. The path where the man was stood had a big main path, if you walk out through some bushes, and so does the other one that I walked through. We're walking down the path for about two minutes, periodically checking behind me still. I thought we were in the clear. We weren't. I was on a straight stretch of path with lots of street lights when I saw him again. He stood beneath one, looking up at it. He was playing with something in his hands. I looked closer and realized it was a knife. This kept walking and walking, continuing to check behind me. My girlfriend's little brother was so scared, he had his head tucked into my chest. I noticed that the man seemed to be moving to new streetlights whenever I turned around. Initially, I thought it was just my eyes playing tricks on me, but I started counting them and realized two streetlights behind him had definitely now turned into five. I could faintly hear that groaning noise he was still making. I picked up the pace a bit, turned a corner, getting into the last stretch of the street before we got back to her house. That was when I heard him behind the row of bushes. That moaning groaning noise sounded angry now. I heard his heavy footsteps bounding down the path. He was running. I immediately broke into a sprint and didn't stop until I turned down an alleyway at the front of the street and got behind my girlfriend's house. There's a big bush there, so I crouched down behind it and spammed her phone with messages to open up the back gate. I hugged her brother close until she finally came out and opened it up for us. We got us inside quickly, even though it felt like years. I went to the front of the house and confirmed that I'd managed to shake him. He was now in the street, circling where I'd been, just outside the alleyway a moment ago. He was still moaning, and he still had that knife in his hand. He started kicking people's bends over, and I called the police immediately. But he was gone by the time they arrived, and as far as I know, they never found him.
there was a similar incident near an area a few months ago that I saw in a local Facebook group, but don't think anything came of that either. Her parents thank me over and over for keeping their son safe. And don't hold any ill will against me for the situation. He went back to pretty much normal the day afterwards, but he still has nightmares about that whole event. When my country isn't on lockdown, I'm still allowed to look after him with my girlfriend. Funnily enough. But we haven't been back to that park ever since. And still to this day, I check over my shoulder and break into a cold sweat. Every time I'm alone on that street. This story took place a year and a half ago when I was 17 years old. It was fall in Campsie, Sydney, Australia. Hence why I decided to name him the Campsie Creeper. I was having an otherwise alright day. It was the weekend. And I'd earlier decided to catch the train one stop over from where I lived and go shopping in the district. Campsie. I'd already bought a couple of dresses and a hat when I decided to sit down and just have lunch. A chocolate milkshake and a takeaway burger. The day itself was nice, so I chose to sit in the communal sitting spot with trees and stores sporadically spread out. Being naturally a people watcher, I just sat quietly on my own as I ate and just watched people go about their own day. I soon, however, noticed a man seemed to be watching me too. He was rather tall, tan, with his dark hair and sharp facial features. If I had to guess, I would say he was in his mid-30s. At first, I thought nothing of it. He was just another person. Without a second thought, I carelessly went on about my day. I bought a couple more items of clothing, a large teddy bear and cute key rings. Just having so much fun shopping. Nothing more, nothing less. The time, however, soon came. Maybe three to four hours later, where I decided it was time to head back home. I headed, satisfied with my purchases, back to the train station. I was halted as I stared up at the train map, not knowing which platform to be on for my ride home. I stood there for a good few minutes, before a man tapped me on my shoulder. I turned around attentively, and slightly confused, and realized it was the same man from earlier. Tall, tan, dark hair, and those same sharp facial features. Do you need help? He had innocently asked, to which I again rendered harmless. Oh yeah, please. I was relieved to have the adult aid in me on my way home. Worried and anxious, I might have gotten lost. It wouldn't have been the first time I've missed or taken the wrong train. The man then asked where I was going, so I told him. He'd showed me to the platform. Easy, simple, over. Or maybe not. While I sat awaiting my train, I noticed him again. He came over, almost anxious looking, just down the stairs, then over to me. Respectively and cautiously, I stood to face him. Come home with me. He almost directed. What? Obviously, I was confused. I said, come home with me now. His tone got more fierce, and I realized he was very serious. I was now borderline shaking as he persisted. Keep in mind, I'm extremely nervous and an anxious person. I've been so all my life. I was too scared to even make a scream or a fuss. Moreover, I'm worried that if someone tried something to this day, I'd still be too in my roots to make a fuss either. Sir, I don't think... I quietly began to refuse before he cut me off. You're coming with me. He sternly spoke again, and with that, the unfortunately prompt train did arrive. I wanted to refuse him again, but he grabbed my bag and shopping bags out of my hand, and then onto the train. I rushed on to get them back. People entered following suit, and the doors closed. The man, still then holding my belongings, walked to a seat and ushered me to sit down next to him. Considering that he still had my belongings, I did so. I just sat blankly beside him for a moment, completely still and completely silent. I felt such a genuine fear, the kind that just makes you want to cry. 
I knew my stop was the next one over, but he still had all my bags. Should I just ditch my belongings with him and escape? My ID with my address, my bank cards? That seems massively dangerous. However, so did sitting around just feeling scared. I had to do something. Taking a minute to compose myself, I later lifted my head and tried to think more rationally. We were still a while from my home, and by the look of things. Next, I looked over to the creeper beside me, quite wearily, only to see him scrolling through his phone. He had pictures of me on it. Pictures of me looking at the train station map. Pictures of me looking through dresses on a rack. Pictures of me waiting to cross the road. I wanted to be sick. He had pictures upon pictures of me just living out my day. How careless I'd been not to notice is all I can think in hindsight. Wanting to get off the train and get off now, I pretended that my phone rang. I answered it loudly and just stood. I talked on the phone to no one as loud as I could and drew attention from idle passengers. Of course, they were more annoyed than they were curious. However, any attention was good attention. I didn't feel so isolated and trapped by the man trying to force me home with him. He shrank back into his chair slightly, and I used my pretend phone call to act as if I was in a hurry to get home. I loudly exclaimed worry for my hurt sister, which none existed, and made sure that people were watching. I kept their eyes my way as I grabbed my bags off of the man who'd snatched them. Clear witness to see if he'd try anything. I felt like an idiot for talking so obvious and loud, truthfully. It was almost embarrassing, be it not necessary. I went over toward the train door as soon as I got my items back and played out the fake phone call. As soon as the doors opened, I felt relief. I put my phone in my pocket and began walking, but it was short-lasted. Wait! He called from behind me as he ran up and grabbed my shoulder. I was turned around and then greeted by further demands. Give me your phone number then. I tried to nicely refuse. Oh, I don't give my phone numbers out to strangers, sorry. He pulled out his phone, opened up the dial pad, and then shoved it at me. Give me your phone number. If it's not yours, you come home with me. His words continued to scare me. I doubted my safety all the more and figured it was safest to just oblige. After doing so, I turned and walked home, crying and in complete panic. I looked over my shoulder all the way home, only having small breakdowns whenever he texted me. I still have those texts and they read as follows. I want to be with you. I go to your house to find you, okay? Can you give me your address? And less coherently and finally, what country did you? Did you have any difficulty? I can give you money to your food. Let us together tonight. When I got home, I informed my aunt and uncle whom I lived with at the time immediately. We went to the police station and filed a police report. I handed over his number, the text, and told them everything. I'm still not sure what has happened to him since, nor where the pictures he took of me might be. I only hope that this is the worst that he's done to anybody, and will ever do. This series of events happened 10 years ago, but the memories haunt me every single day. I was a senior at a large university in the South. I was deeply in love with my girlfriend at the time, Destiny. Our relationship had survived several stints of long distance and often across multiple continents. We were truly devoted to one another. We shared a room in the bottom half of a two-story duplex with our roommate, Teresa. The duplex had two rooms and was bright orange precast slab concrete. The government built our entire neighborhood in the 1940s for returning World War II vets. Over the subsequent decades, the students, who took over as tenants as the older families moved to the suburbs, painted the duplex in vivid pastels in all sorts of funky color combinations. The accumulation of students and the wild color scheme earned our neighborhood the nickname Partywood. Our city was vibrant, was full of art, live music, and youthful energy. 
there is a new gallery opening for music festivals to check out every weekend. The place was a student's dreamland. It was also low on crime. Though these points sound like a perfect combination for fun, they were also a recipe for carelessness and a false sense of invincibility. One evening in fall after Destiny and I returned from a late night concert, we encountered a visibly shaken Teresa in the living room with a blanket pulled up to her neck. The TV was turned to static, and the local broadcast had stopped, as we poor students couldn't afford cable. She was just looking at static and listening to the white noise shaking her head. Teresa, what's wrong? Destiny asked. You look like you've seen a ghost. Teresa looked at us and said bluntly with terror in her eyes. There was a face in my window. I saw it. I immediately ran into her room. She had pulled the curtains to the edges of her windows to cover every pane of glass. I pulled back the curtains and looked outside. There was nothing but pecan trees in our backyard, swaying in the night breeze. While Destiny comforted Teresa, I went outside and checked under the area of her window for some sign of an intruder. Again, I found nothing. Here's where I should note that Teresa was a very kind and gentle person, but was prone to drink. That very night, we saw evidence of two newly finished bottles of wine. There was also a stack of horror films that she habitually watched atop the VCR. Destiny made a bed for Teresa on the couch, and eventually we made our way back to the bedroom. You think it's possible her imagination just got the best of her? I whispered to Destiny in the dark. Maybe so, but she seemed really, really shaken up. We shouldn't just dismiss what she said. You're right, I whispered as I kissed her forehead. I'll talk to some of the neighbors in the morning and see if anyone saw anything or heard anything suspicious. I love you. Sleep well. The next day, I did my routine jog through Partywood and encountered some friends picking up beer cans and solo cups scattered across the yard after a rager that they'd thrown last night. One of them, Sam, was a buddy from my hometown who I shared a couple of courses with at university. I told him about the events of the night before, and he began to shake his head slowly as a grimace took over his normally cheerful face. Oh man, this is bad news. I've been hearing about a peeping Tom running through this neighborhood. I know Teresa does a lot of sipping, but y'all should take this very seriously. I mean it. You never know with these type of guys. They always get bolder and bolder. Watch your back, man. I thank Sam for the info, and with a heart heavy with concern, turned away to jog back home. As I started to run, Sam caught me by the arm. Hey, if y'all need me, just holler, and I'll be there to help you here. Thanking him again, I ran back home. I told the girls what I'd learned over coffee that morning. We all agreed to keep our eyes open and try not to leave anyone home alone at the house. Things were quiet for a couple of months, with the fear which had been in the front of our minds gradually disappearing as classes, party, and the joy of just being young and in love returned to our primary preoccupations. That all changed one afternoon when I returned home from class to find a police squad car parked out front. I ran inside to find one police officer searching the house and another examining a broken kitchen window. Apparently while Teresa was showering and Destiny was napping in our bedroom, someone had broken in and stolen several pairs of panties out of the dryer and Teresa's keys, which of course included our house key. The police found no physical evidence of any intruder, but urged us to immediately change our locks and remain hypervigilant. One officer took me aside and walked me to the backyard. Outside my bedroom window was a chair, a chair I didn't recognize. It was pointed at the windows next to our bed. He'd been watching us for God knows how many nights, watching us sleep, watching us make love. I nearly wretched. We were once again on edge. Teresa took to taping her curtains to the wall so that not even one sliver of space could provide a view inside her room. Destiny had long been planning to move to Germany for a study abroad program. She said goodbye with a worried face. I love you. Be careful and take care of Teresa. I was so despondent. 
I missed my girl so badly and didn't feel safe in my own home. I took to joining Teresa in her nightly drinking, and we kept to the living room where there were no windows. I tended to sleep on the couch, the bed seeming too large without destiny there. One night, Teresa was out with her friends, and I was drunk and full of self-pity. It was approaching 1 a.m. I headed to the bathroom to relieve myself. My mind drifted to Germany and wondered what Destiny was doing at the moment I sat on the commode. Suddenly I hear the crunch of dead leaves far off in the backyard. My ears perked up, and adrenaline immediately coursed through my body. I was, however, not finished with my current activities. The crunch of leaves became louder and nearer. The pattern was unmistakably that of human footsteps. I cannot begin to describe the absolute dread I felt anchored to the toilet, unable to move, knowing he was coming toward the bathroom window. Finally, the footsteps stopped. The window was about seven feet off the ground, but there was an air compressor beneath it, one could stand on. I waited, my breath held, fear coursing through my brain. Slowly, so freaking slowly, I saw fingers appear at the edge of the window. Like the legs of a tarantula, they wrapped over the ledge, and I saw the top of a head being pulled up into view. Time seemed to crawl to a stop as his eyes and face came into view. We made eye contact. I have to believe he was surprised to find, rather than a freshly showered young woman, me, pants around my ankles, fear and rage in my eyes. I raised my fist and screamed. You mother at the window. He fell backwards and I prayed to all the gods that ever were that he'd either broken his neck or his leg. I quickly wiped and pulled up my pants and sprinted to the backyard and saw his back as he left the fence and disappeared off into the darkness. I called 911 and the cops came quickly. They informed me that they'd been keeping an eye on the neighborhood as the peeping events had become much more frequent. I rode around in a patrol car for an hour, trying to ID the guy. Nothing. He'd simply just disappeared. Teresa moved out. She couldn't handle the fear any longer, and I didn't blame her. My landlord even cut the rent so I could afford to stay while I looked for a new roommate. The word had spread about the partywood peeper, though. It was very difficult to find any takers. I'm an honest person, and when people asked why the last roommate left... I felt compelled to tell them the truth, and that was usually a conversation ender. I talked to Sam about the situation, and we came up with a plan. We set up a camera in the bathroom and ran a cable to the TV. We ran the shower, turned the light on, and parted a curtain to make it appear that someone was probably wet and naked and peepable. Meanwhile, Sam and I watched the monitor in the living room and waited to see a face appear in that window. I'd purchased a stun baton and bear spray, as well as zip tie cuffs that riot police use on protesters. We intended to run the opposite sides of the house, bear spray his face, zip tie him, and then take him inside where I honestly planned to use the stun baton on his testicles until the police arrived. I know, I know, kind of savage, but it's taking the law into my own hands, and there would probably be legal consequences. But in the moment, I didn't care. The sense of unease and violation I felt had ruined something within me. Something was rotten, and I wanted to take it out on him. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, we never had a chance to enact this plan. He never came to my window again. Soon, I too left the country for a job teaching abroad. Destiny and I reunited in a different continent and tried to put the vents behind us. For the most part, we did just that. I learned years later, he'd gone on to break into a house and one of the neighbors. To my knowledge, this man was never apprehended. I only wish I could have stopped him before he hurt anyone. That's my story. Thanks for reading. It helps to share this. It's not unusual for me to trek out on solo hiking trips. 
For context, I'm a 31-year-old female. I frequently visit the provincial parks that are generally well used. It's rare that I end up on a hike not seeing at least one or two other people. I grew up going on camping and hiking trips, and I feel very comfortable out in nature. I always inform people where I'm going and when to expect me back. Safety first, right? One day last year, I was going stir crazy, so I took myself out to a popular nature educational center. A bunch of trails stem from this one spot. They're not long trails, but are all interconnected, so it's easy to create your own distance. It was midweek, so I wasn't really expecting to encounter many people, maybe a school group at most. I grabbed my backpack, locked the car, and head out. It was a beautifully sunny day in mid-autumn, so it was a little chilly out. I was listening to the sounds of nature surrounding me. Some squirrels, birds, even a deer crossed my trail at one point. I was sticking with the main trail, which had educational signs identifying the different types of plants as you went along. I made my way up the first little hill, and then made my way down the path where it leads to a sharp right turn. Up ahead, I caught sight of a man wearing a dark blue jacket. Strange, I hadn't seen any signs of the person or heard them, but whatever. Normally, I'm comforted seeing someone else, but this time... My gut instinct was just not happy. I made note of which way the person went and continued along. Blue Jacket had taken the path I wanted to take, so it created a longer hike. It would have been a lot more secluded and less traveled. So for once, I tried to be smart, listen to my gut, and just follow the main route back to my car, keep it short and safe. I still had about two kilometers to get back to the parking lot. Clouds decided they wanted to skirt across the sky, making the woods a little dull and ominous. I kept looking over my shoulder, feeling very unsettled. The trees cast finger-like shadows that did not help calm my imagination down whatsoever. One of my favorite spots on this main trail had a few huge boulders and rock formations right smack dab in the middle that you had to go around. It's really neat for photos and climbing on a normal day, but today... They filled me with even more dread. I couldn't pinpoint why at first until I noticed some scuffs around the base of the rock going all the way around. The trail is very obvious which way to go, left, and these marks were wrong. It was like someone walked around the rocks, dragging their foot behind them. An animal maybe? I couldn't figure it out. I wanted to turn around and go back the way I came but that would have added four kilometers to just getting back to the car. I stuck close to the far side of the real path, keeping a close eye on that rock formation. As I made it to the other side of the rocks, I caught sight of some blue fabric, that same blue jacket that I saw earlier. The person moved as if ducking down between some rocks to avoid being seen. For Blue Jacket Man to reach the rocks before me, he either cut his own path to the woods or sprinted about five to six kilometers of trails. I did not like the thought of either option, as I did not know this person and didn't want to know them at this point. Maybe he's taken a leak. Sure, I'll go with that. I picked up my pace and dug my phone out, texted my usual hiking friend telling them all the details just in case I suddenly went missing. I glanced behind me again while the rocks were still in sight, and now saw the man just standing there looking at me. I ran all the way back to my car, hopped in, and immediately locked the doors. Curiously, there wasn't a single other vehicle in the parking lot or on the nearby road. This place was nowhere near any towns, so I have no clue where Mr. Blue Jacket even came from. I took a couple of minutes to sort myself out in the car, and as I pulled out to leave, I looked at the trailhead. There was that damn blue jacket on the signpost I had just passed to get in my car, with no one visible nearby. I was so spooked by this encounter, I refused to hike there alone ever again. Maybe it was all just an innocent misunderstanding, but it sure scared the hell out of me.
The story takes place in the fall of 2013 in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I'm a military policeman. My girlfriend was at work and as a hot day began to turn into some thunderstorms, my buddy Nick and I decided to go explore some back roads and just get out of the heat in town. Southern Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used and many totally forgotten and overgrown. Nick and I spent many of our days off, starting on roads that we knew, finding roads we didn't know, driving for hours into the mountains, eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building up over the mountains, we set off on a road we'd never been on and began the drive into the mountains themselves. After driving for over an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of other people in the woods. We rounded a bend into thick fir woods and emerged into a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed at the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. It was painted bright orange and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow just to get a closer look. I remember feeling apprehensive as we approached it. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the aspen grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees, as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I myself am not very tall, only about 5'5". Five five. Regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me back over to the truck, and I noticed he was looking back into the Aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place inside those thick trees. A small one-man tent was set back into the trees, about 50 feet from that strange table. I had an initial fear of dread and felt certain that there was someone inside that tent, and if we could see the tent, they could see us. There were no campgrounds in this area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely someone camping so remotely would be at the very least a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we saw no movement, nor heard any sounds coming from it. Nick suggested I call out, but I didn't want to, so I did anyway. Hey, uh, anyone in there? No reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and just leaving this strange area. But we began to fear for the worst. What if there's a body in that tent? What if someone had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it all the same. After a little debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the camp. Should we need to leave in a hurry, he would be waiting behind the wheel. With my heart pounding, I started walking through the trees toward that tent. I was totally keyed up with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built. No wood collected. The tent was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave and tell Nick what I'd seen. As I left, I heard Nick yelling. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get out of here. Not knowing why he was yelling, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat up old Ford Taurus on the road blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way we'd come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. 
Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I still do not know if the person in the back was a male or a female. I called the state police. They promised to send a trooper out to check the scene. However, I received a call the next day from a trooper, stating that the campsite, the backpacks, and the clothing was all gone, though he could tell people had been in that area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove. I have not returned to that area, and I never intend to again. A quick backstory. I work at a gas station on a main route. We see a lot of travelers passing through. Only one person works each shift, and it's a 24-hour store. We are short-staffed, so I agreed to an overnight. I'm female, and I work in a state that's always had its self-serve gas stations. So one night this guy comes in, and I asked him if he needed any help. He says no. He's getting gas at the pump, but just needs to use the bathroom. I go back to work on whatever invoices that we got yesterday. The guy uses the bathroom and then goes back outside. About five to seven minutes later, he comes back inside and tells me that he's confused about the pump. He directly says, You might have to come outside and help me. Customers don't often say this. They usually just complain that it's not working. So immediately, I'm feeling weird about this guy. I shake it off because he kind of looks like a nerd and I don't feel afraid of him really. I glance at the register to see what errors came up for his pump. There's no error. The register doesn't even say it was in use. Even if someone tried to pay and nothing's wrong with their payment, it will at least say payment or loyalty time doubt. It literally had no sign of him trying to use it before asking me for help. So I just ask him if he wants to pay inside. He agrees to this. He gets his wallet out of his car and then pays $10. I give him a receipt and he says, Can you help me? I... I don't understand the machine. Again, I say, we really aren't allowed to leave the store during overnight shift. It's just me here, and it's not safe to go outside. He proceeds to say, I don't understand what it's asking me. I need help. I'm not scary. I tell him again that I can't go outside because it's store policy for the overnight shift to say. And then I tell him, it's not that you're scary. I just can't go outside. I would have to tell the same thing to a little old lady asking for help at this hour. Which, it is true. We can't even take the trash out during overnights. He starts to walk away from the register counter. Then again, stops the door. Asking me one last time to come outside and help him. Now at this point, I'm pretty annoyed. I've said no twice now. I'm not going. Stop asking. So I finally say in a super annoyed tone. Okay. All you need to do is one, pick up the nozzle, two, select fuel grade button, and three, put it in your tank and squeeze the handle. I'm not going outside. He finally goes back to his car, and the register tells me he has no trouble pumping the gas. His plates also seem like they're from the state that I work in. This kind of thing normally wouldn't make me suspicious, but the fact that he originally opted for me to go outside instead of bringing money inside is just weird. Along with how he didn't bother to use the pump before he came inside to ask for help, claiming it wasn't working, and him not taking my first no for an answer, no means no. So to the potential gas station abductor, it's not meet again. In 2007, I was a freshman going on sophomore in college and my brother Martin was still in high school. We have two much younger siblings so at the time they were both elementary school age. My parents decided to take a cruise for their 20th wedding anniversary that year so my brother and I were voluntold to watch my younger brother and sister Cole and Charlotte. My brother's best friend Christian stayed with us a while while my parents were gone and he helped us plan out fun activities with the younger siblings. One idea that they were really excited about was a camping trip 
as my family wasn't really the outdoorsy type. Their eyes lit up at the prospect of cooking our dinner over a campfire and fishing in the stream. Since it was early summertime, we had the great luck of warm but not too hot weather and a beautiful clear sky for stargazing. Finally packed and ready to go for that somewhat long drive into the mountains, we checked into our campsite before dark and Cole and Charlotte helped us to set up the tent. It was strange but there was no other people at this campground, which was unusual for this time of year. Once we finished dinner, my younger brother and sister were ready for sleep so Martin, Christian and I stayed awake a little longer, just catching up and getting things ready for the next morning. Suddenly a white Astro van pulled up into the camping spot directly next to ours. He had dozens to choose from, but chose to park right next to us. Oh well, Christian said, at least we have company now. He called out a quick hello to our new neighbor, but got no response back. I don't know why, but I got an uneasy feeling almost immediately, but just decided to push it aside and continue to get the fishing poles ready for the following morning then put the food away for the night to ward off the bears and other wild animals. Over the next hour or so, things began to get weird. The man that parked next to us got out of his van to just sit at this picnic table with only a small fire. From our roaring fire, I could see that he was looking over directly at us. However, his fire died out completely several minutes later. He just continued to sit there, I could feel him staring, but I couldn't see his face anymore. He was just sitting there, breathing. Christian and Martin noticed that I was beginning to get uneasy, and they also picked up on how creepy the situation had started to become. Martin whispered to me, Why is he breathing like that? I don't feel safe anymore. I told Christian and Martin that I was going to stay awake because I don't trust this guy. As soon as they moved from the fire into the tents, the man rose from the picnic table and started to move toward us. I immediately called out hello, and again got no response from him. Finally, in a whim of panic, I demanded that we all pack up and get the hell out of here and go home immediately. Christian and Martin got out of their tent and saw the figure of the man just standing there staring at us, continuing to breathe hard. We tried to stay as quiet and as calm as possible while we packed up, also trying not to alarm Cole or Charlotte during the process. Finally throwing everything in the trunk, we just drove away, not looking back. But before leaving the site itself, I asked if we could go to the check-in area at the lodge and see what the hell was going on and if they knew anything more. What was this guy's deal? To my surprise, there was no one else registered at that campsite that evening. The story doesn't end there though. About six months later, I was in my sophomore year of school when a local hiker went missing a county over from where we camped and where I went to college. She was doing some normal hiking with her dog. Sadly, she turned up several months later. She'd been murdered and found in a white Astro van. When the news released the photos of the van and the man's face, I knew who it was. I got a call from my brother and his friend. They recognized the man too. We came to find out that this wasn't his first murder, and several years later, he became known as the National Force Serial Killer. I sincerely mean when I say that I'm an incredibly cautious camper now because of this encounter. Thinking that it could have been us or my younger siblings still gives me nightmares to this day when I think about it. We recently had a reunion. Christian, Martin, and I, and we talked about what happened to us more than 10 years ago. It's amazing how we all remember the details, as they're etched into our memories forever. So to that creepy, heavy-breathing, would-be serial killer, never ever meet again. When I was about 10 or 11 years old, I shared a room with my brother, who was around 15. We both live in the suburb area of New York, not the greatest area, but not riddled with crime. There are two windows in my room, 
one that overlooks the backyard, and one that connects to the front porch. It comes in quite a handy for my brother to sneak out and meet his friends. If you step on the window, you are on the porch, so anyone on the porch can access this window. I was never bothered by that thought because, quite honestly, it's never even crossed my mind. My bed was touching this window, while my brother's bed was perpendicular to mine. It was an odd setup, but that's really beside the point. Now this was before we had any sort of smartphones or laptops to keep ourselves occupied. So on nights when we weren't sleepy, we would stay up talking to one another, making up dumb games to pass the time. The event I'm about to tell you about took place during the summer. We stayed up into the late hours of the night, perks of having no school. It was probably around 2 a.m., and eventually, we were playing a game where one of us was a goalkeeper and the other was taking a shot. We would both say at the same time, either left, center, or right. If the goalkeeper guessed the same as the one taking the shot, he would get a point. And if the person taking the shot set a position other than what the goalie said, they would get a point. We went for a couple of rounds, and I was beating his ass at this, even though it's irrelevant. I don't remember what round we were on, but we did our 3, 2, 1 countdown. And my brother, the goalkeeper, said left, and I, the shooter, said center. Then a voice from outside the porch window said, Left. Me and my brother froze. We had the shade down, but my mom had left the porch light on so that that was the only thing illuminating our room. The dim porch light coming in from the borders of the shade. At the time in my house, my mother was on the opposite side of the house. My sister, the room over, and my dad in the basement. So me and my brother were shitting our pants practically. We waited for what seemed to be like an hour, but was probably only 30 to 45 seconds. And we hear a giggle and a playful knock at the window. Hey, let's go another round. Come on, boys. The voice said in this cheerful, playful tone. Honestly, I want to say it was a scary voice and sounded menacing, but it wasn't. It just sounded like a woman not too old, but young enough. Just normal. Like a normal sounding voice, nothing off about it besides where it was coming from and the time it came. Me and my brother were seriously freaked out. I was about to break down because of how close this woman was actually to us. The thought that all I had to do was lift the shade, and I'd be face to face with this person scared the shit out of me, and made me go as still and stiff as if I just looked into Medusa's eyes. After a while of me and my brother not responding, my brother slowly moving from his bed to the door as if to not make any noise. As my brother was tiptoeing to the door, the sound of nails being ran down a window started. It was very slow, from top to bottom. At that point, my brother made it to the door. He looked back at me and brought his fingers to his lip, gesturing for me to keep quiet. Once the nails stopped running down my window, I heard her light footsteps make their way off my porch and disappear into the night. I laid there for what felt like an eternity, not moving until my brother returned with my mother and I saw her move hastily by my door, making her way to the front door. The porch light flipped off, and I was left in darkness with my brother waiting in the doorway for my mother's return. I heard my mom call my dad up the stairs, and his groggy, annoyed footsteps coming up. They talked and then came into me and my brother's room, and we relayed what had just happened. Apparently, my mom caught sight of the lady turning out of our driveway, behind some tall bushes, Thank God we had a long driveway, otherwise my mom probably would have thought we were just crazy. Considering no harm was done besides leaving me terrified of my window, my parents didn't call the police. They just thought it was really weird and stayed up the rest of the night to make sure that she didn't return. I'm 17 years old now. My brother is in college, so I have this room all to myself. My bed still touches the window because I'm too lazy to move the rest of the furniture in my room so I can move my bed. The shade to that window has not been open since that incident and probably never will.
This story is from a childhood friend who told me this and it still unnerves me to this day. She was genuinely freaked out and her family even backed up this claim. So here you go. So basically my friend and her family moved into this rental property, which my friend said was haunted. It gave everyone this awe feeling. Those who visited and stayed over would mention it themselves. I myself experienced this odd feeling of foreboding whenever I went over there and believed in the consensus that the house was indeed haunted. It honestly felt oppressed and you would just feel this pitiful dread. It's hard to put into words, it was just extremely uncomfortable to say the least. Anyway, now on to the event that is the basis of this post. It was enough for my friend's family to pack up and stay with relatives until they moved out permanently. On that fateful afternoon, my friend had arrived back home from a park and heard an argument taking place in the kitchen between her mom and dad. My friend thought this was odd as both of her parents should be at work, so she called out to her mother, Mom, before unlocking the front door and going inside. My friend said the house fell instantly silent, an uncanny silence like the air had been sucked out of the place. It felt stifling and just wrong. Then her mom said, Hey, we're just in here. My friend was just outside the closed kitchen door at this point and froze before opening. This was indeed her mother's voice, but something was off. Like the cadence was missing that actually made it her mother. It sounded flat and unnatural. My friend decided to bolt back out the front door and just wait outside until her brother came home. She said as soon as she turned her back to the house, she saw her mother peering at her from the lounge room window, but it wasn't her mother. The face was the same. Everything was the same, but her face was devoid of anything that made it her mother. There was no recognition on her mother's face. There was no indication that she was even looking directly at her daughter. There was no emotion in the expression. Nothing. The eyes looked back unstaring and utterly blank. My friend screamed and ran down the street to her mother's work and confirmed that she was there this whole time and had never been home. Initially, my friend's mother reasoned that someone must have broke in, but a later investigation proved that nothing had been stolen and the back door was locked, as was the front door when my friend came home. No one could rationalize who my friend saw in that window and why it looked so much like her mother. So that was the deciding factor to nope the hell out of there and find somewhere else to live. The landlord of the house denied anything like this happening when they lived there, but did admit that tenants didn't stay long, saying there was something wrong inside that house. My friend also told me that she was the only one who actually saw anything definitively sinister while living in the house. But her family all said they definitely agreed that they felt an evil presence there which ultimately manifested into the doppelganger experience that my friend had. Utterly terrifying. I've told this story probably over a hundred times, and despite being the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me, I've come to appreciate that it makes for a great story so I figure I'll share it with you all here. I'll start by saying that I've always hated going camping. My parents sent me to summer camp every year in Colorado, which involved at least one camping trip into the woods. Despite these trips, I always resented them. The heavy bag, the lack of toilets, the spiders that always found their way into my tent. When I turned 16 and became a camp counselor in training, my distaste for the whole experience briefly changed. At that age, we were only a few years older than the oldest campers, but we were given considerable leeway in what we were allowed to do. Most nights, we would have to stay in the cabin with our campers, but it was rumored that the camping trip was a time where counselors in training would get drunk and smoke weed and hook up with each other after everyone else went to sleep. What I didn't know, however, was the events of that camping trip would soon dissuade me from ever going camping in the woods ever again. The trip itself began as any other. Altogether there, there was probably 30 people on the trip, four counselors in training, four counselors, and around 20 or so boys and girls between the ages of 13 and 14. 
walking in a single file line up and down the various trails. You can hardly hear any sounds of the nature over the conversations and laughters of said campers. Several hours went by. We made our way through a dense marshy area and up a steep incline populated with evergreens and aspens. I myself wasn't the most athletic kid, so it was around this point that I found myself at the back of the line with one of the other counselors in training Jordan, as well as two other campers who were also struggling to keep up. The four of us began chatting. In our distracted state, we began to fall more and more behind the rest of the campers until the last of them faded out of view around a bend about 50 feet up the way. Unconcerned, we kept walking at the same slow pace, but after 30 minutes or so, the trail started to level off, and I began to feel increasingly anxious. Not only had the rest of the group disappeared ahead of us, but we had entered a stretch of completely dead evergreens, half of which looked scorched by a wildfire, and the other half appeared to have been killed by disease. The eeriness of the landscape was punctuated by a small derelict cabin sitting in the middle of the scorched forest. Seemingly untouched by the fire that must have spread through that area, we were so enraptured by the scene that one of the campers screamed when a twig broke behind us. Jordan and I started laughing a bit, but we quickly stopped when we turned to look where that sound had come from. Not 20 feet behind us was this haggard looking man with a messy nest of black hair and a long black beard slowly making his way up the trail with his eyes locked upon us. He didn't appear to have any hiking supplies on him. We had no idea how long he'd been walking behind us either. Being young, we were naturally pretty freaked out, but Jordan managed to give the guy a slight wave before saying to the rest of us, Come on, let's speed up and get back with the rest of the group. As we turned to continue our way up the path, the man mumbled a question that was hard to hear, and I was shocked when Jordan turned around to ask the man to repeat himself. The man muttered again slightly louder this time. Going camping? Jordan answered the man that yes, we are going camping, to which he smiled slightly before stating in a creepy and ominous voice, Better be careful. We nodded and gave a half-hearted thank you before continuing on our way to try to find the rest of the group, this time with a much faster pace. Although the man had been walking up the same trail as us when we saw him, he didn't continue, but instead just stood there in the middle of the trail, watching us, as we made our way back up the winding path and disappeared from his view. Finally, we managed to catch up with the rest of the group, who had all been waiting for us, we told the adult counselors about our interaction with that strange man. They shrugged it off, telling us the guy probably lived in that cabin and just wanted to know what we were doing near his property. Still, I felt unnerved by that encounter. When we finally arrived at the campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling that that man had somehow followed all of us. Eventually, though, I put it out of my mind and managed to enjoy myself a little bit. Everyone else had gone to bed. Jordan and the other counselor in training from the boys' cabin had brought out two warm Mike's hards that they'd stolen from the counselor's quarters, and I took out a joint that I'd stashed away for this exact occasion. To avoid getting in trouble, we decided to hike out into the woods a bit to smoke the joint. We made our way to the edge of the river where we washed our pots and pans earlier in that day. The spot itself was eerily silent. I thought of the man from earlier kept popping into my head. Assuming that I was just cold, not anxious, Jordan gave me his blue hoodie, and this prompted one of the other girls to suggest that we switch tents for the night, and she could sleep in the same tent as the other boy. I had absolutely no problem with this, and after smoking the joint, we made our way back to our own separate tents, which were pitched slightly away from the others. We discreetly sipped on those Mike Carters while telling each other scary camping stories. Some time passed. One of the boys was in the middle of telling a rather muddled story that he was clearly making up on the spot when he suddenly just stopped. In the silence, we could hear what sounded like footsteps crunching on pine needles about 40 feet away, near one of the other campers' tents. As we strained to listen to what was going on, the noises stopped, and even though we assumed it was just one of the campers getting up to go to the bathroom, 
stoned and hopped up from the scary stories. We all decided to call it a night and go to our tents. Jordan followed suit and we awkwardly made our way before eventually just going to sleep. I don't know what time it was. Must have been quite late. I suddenly woke up to the distinct sounds of footsteps walking around or near our tent. Shot with adrenaline, I tried to lay as still as possible and quiet my breathing. From the sound, it was apparent that someone was less than three feet away from the front of our tent, seemingly pacing back and forth. I turned to wake up Jordan, but I was immediately put at ease when I saw that he wasn't next to me. Assuming Jordan was the one that I'd been hearing, I closed my eyes and was just beginning to drift back off to sleep when I heard the tent unzip. I felt Jordan lie down next to me after a few moments and put his arms around me and began to spoon me. After nearly drifting off to sleep again, I realized I had to go to the bathroom and muttered something about having to go pee before beginning to unzip my sleeping bag. Seemingly annoyed by the noise, Jordan lazily turned over, pulling his hoodie up over his head before going still again, quietly so not to wake him. I unzipped the tent and quickly scanned the campsite for any movement, comforting myself that Jordan had just gone pee and was fine. I put my shoes on and began making the trek across the campsite to the designated pee zone. I just made it to the area and pulled my pants down when I heard rustling coming from the campsite. As if someone was rummaging through our supplies and our bags. Still slightly drunk, I tried to pull my pants up and in my haste, I lost my balance and tried to catch myself with a branch that made this loud snapping noise when I grabbed it. I tried to gather myself as quietly as I could, but when I finally managed to look up, I could see that there was a figure making its way across our campsite in my direction. Before I could even think, I was blinded by the bright light of a flashlight shining directly into my eyes, and the light was getting bigger, so whoever it was, they were coming toward me. Frozen and panicked, the figure got 10 feet away from me before I heard Jordan's voice say, Sorry, it's just me. I breathed a sigh of relief. But then Jordan asked me something that really confused me. Have you seen my blue hoodie? I know you gave it back to me, but I think one of the campers might have stolen it from my bag while I was sleeping. After a brief pause, I managed to stutter out. But you were just wearing it when you got back in the tent. What he said next made my blood run cold. What are you talking about? He said, it's been missing since we got back from the river. I even went down there to see if I'd left it by accident, but still couldn't find it. Thought I'd check the boys' bags and that's when I saw you. My confusion quickly turned to sheer terror as I realized the man who got into the tent with me just moments prior was not Jordan. Sensing that something was wrong, Jordan asked me what happened. I managed to get out that whoever stole his hoodie was now sleeping in our tent. Not believing me, Jordan insisted on walking back to the tent to check it out for himself. As slowly and as quietly as possible, we made our way back to the side of the tent. And while Jordan flipped on his flashlight and shone it through the nylon lining, he let out a high-pitched scream. We both could see the clear outline of a man's shadow, lying still inside the tent. What happened next is a bit of a blur. We ran to the pod of tents on the other side of the campground where the older counselors were sleeping and frantically unzipped their tent, yelling for them to come out, that there was a man inside our tent. I remember panic setting in as our counselor slowly and groggily woke up, but after a bit more frantic yelling, they finally managed to understand the severity of the situation when a commotion broke out on the other side of the camp near our tent. By the time they ran to the scene, however, they only found an unzipped tent and a bunch of our things littered on the ground that the man had apparently knocked over or thrown during his escape. After that, we heard the counselors radioing back down to camp to call the police, and we could tell that they were just as scared as we were. I don't think any of us slept after that. Luckily, we only had to wait a few hours for the sun to come up, and by that time, a few of the other counselors had arrived with guns to escort us back to camp. On our way back down, 
One of the campers found Jordan's jacket tied around one of the trees on the path, like some kind of marker. Needless to say, he didn't want it back, and we just left it there. To this day, I still can't say for certain if that man in the tent was the same guy that we ran into earlier on the trail. His face, and that night itself, still haunt me. This past Monday, my coworkers and I returned to our hotel after a day of work in the field. Rebecca and I walked to our rooms, and as we stood outside of them, I opened up mine and saw someone inside my bathroom. I said, Hello? Nobody answered. My first instinct was that it was probably just a cleaning lady in there for some reason. And then, I saw my bag with my clothes in her hands. So I said to my coworker, there's a woman in my room. Then I asked the woman, hey, what are you doing with my stuff? The story gets a little fuzzy here because I can't remember everything that I said in the moment that I said it. She just kept mumbling about how her key still worked, how it still worked and that's how she got in. I was in shock. She was obviously very flustered having been caught mid robbery. She dropped my bags and fumbled around with her purse in a white plastic bag. By this time, my coworker was behind me, watching all of the insanity unfold. The woman was scrambling and walking toward the door and I said, what's in the bag? Thinking it was probably my stuff and she said, no, no, it's, it's just my things, it's just my things, I'll show you. And so she did. I looked and I actually didn't see anything of mine. So since I'm obviously still in shock, I just let her leave. I went into my room and it's been ransacked. I did a quick glance over just to see if anything had been taken. All of my electronics were still there. Then I went to the bathroom and saw my underwear, my bikini, and my clothes shoved into my own bags randomly. Even my passport was shoved in there too. I then looked over on the counter and saw that she'd gotten into my medication. In the moment, I'm not really sure what was going through my head, other than I just wanted it back so I quickly ran out the door to go find her. I ran to the laundry room downstairs and out to the sides of the hotel and see her anywhere. Quickly realized I was never gonna find her, so my coworker and I went down to the lobby to tell them what had happened and we called the police. We went back up to my room to wait and I noticed that there's this metal bat laying on my bed, a little larger than those novelty wooden bats that you can get at a baseball game. And there's also a flashlight on the end of it. She must have left it behind in her hurry. She also left behind a necklace that must have fallen out of her bag when she was scrambling with mine. I was mostly freaking out at this point because I'd thought she'd gotten away with my medication that I really needed. The police ended up getting there and took our statements and looked around the room as well. One thing that I did notice is there were bits of drywall on the sink and I pointed that out to the police but none of us really knew where it was coming from. We started looking at the door and the windows to see if she'd pried her way in somehow. There was nothing. So we kind of just went with the idea that she had a spare key or something, even though the hotel front desk was adamant that there's no way that that could be. The officer that came had brought two more officers as backup because they thought the woman might still be in the vicinity. But after our statements were taken, there was nothing else they could really do, so they just left. I sat down to finally make some calls to tell people. So I'm on the phone, looking at the drywall and the mirror on the wall right above it. Then it hit me. I got my coworker and asked her to help me pull this mirror off the wall. We took the mirror down, and there's a hole just big enough for a desperate junkie to squeeze through. I asked Brian and Rebecca if I should call the cops again to let them know that I found this. And my boss said, there's still two cops in the parking lot. So I went down to tell them. The female cop kind of rolled her eyes, but the young guy said, I'll come check it out. They both came back up, looked inside the hole and found a pillow, blankets, cigarettes, clothes, and toothbrushes. This woman had been living in the wall behind the mirror for God knows how long. She had access to me and my room at all times. 
One of the officers called the original officer to come back and take pictures of this. She explained to him what was going on and all I hear over the radio is no f***ing way. He comes back, takes pictures, and is just as mind blown as the rest of us. Obviously, we packed up and left immediately. What's even crazier is she probably had been there for a long time. The last time we stayed at this hotel, I would randomly smell cigarette smoke and I assumed it was just someone smoking in their bathroom and maybe it was traveling through the vents. But nope, it was just some junkie smoking on just the other side of my mirror. She had access to other rooms too. The holes in the walls were from a renovation and the hotel hadn't properly patched and just covered it up with the mirror. She could have been hanging out in people's rooms when they were gone. This is all just insane. I'm taking a little time off. We've all had bad dates, right? This is the only one I've had to date that rang every alarm bell and waved every single red flag. I'll preface this by saying I don't go on many dates as it is, but when I do, I make sure I follow safety protocols only by meeting my date in public places. I also let either family or friends know where I'm going to be and park in a populated place close to wherever we're supposed to meet. So the state initially suggested that we meet at his house to watch a movie and have a few drinks. I told him no, I don't feel comfortable with that and I only want to meet in public. At first he seemed okay with this, but then he brought it up a few more times. I asked if money was an issue, or if that was the case we could meet up another time or just forget about it altogether. On my date backtracked and went with my idea of meeting at a cafe that I chose. He turns up in a two door car, this detail is relevant, then goes into the cafe and I follow behind and introduce myself. After a very quick polite introduction, things get weird. After I order a coke, he says, Don't you want a drink? I was going to pop into the bar and get one. I say, no, I'm not drinking. And he just looks at me like WTF, as if I'm being unreasonable. I already explained in messages that I don't drink as I'm on medication, so having to re-explain it again kind of pisses me off. He seems disappointed and goes to order a cider from the bar while I get a table. We sit down with our drinks and immediately goes on about going back to his place again, even though the original plan was to stay here and order food, and I'd already stated previously, it was not going to happen. He says something along the lines of having a few drinks and then just eating in his place. I said, no, we don't even have to eat, we can just have our drinks and then leave. He gets defensive and says he has money but prefers if we go back to his. I make an awkward joke and say, you're not a killer or something are you instead of laughing it off he just stares at me and then says you don't think i would hurt you do you i laugh uncomfortably and say of course not but really i'm relieved this date won't be going any further he suddenly says are you gonna follow me in your car because that would make sense how about we go in my car i've got packages in the front so you have to squeeze in the back and i'll drop you back off to your car after in reality, that made less sense than me following him in my own car and then driving home from his house after. The fact that it was completely illogical made it even more creepy in my mind. Every alarm bell was going off at this point and I said, Look, I don't want to go to your house and your insistence is giving me the creeps. He looked shocked, mumbled about something about the toilet and excused himself from the table. A few moments later, I see him through the cafe window getting into his car and just driving off. Massive bullet dodged in my opinion. The fact that his car didn't have back doors made it even more sinister because imagine if something happened in the car, I wouldn't be able to escape. Someone suggested that I share this weird encounter in this group. I assure you this encounter is not fiction. It's completely real. I wish it was just so it would be easier to accept, but that isn't the case. This encounter happened in February of 2007. 
I used to work third shift at a paper stock factory warehouse. The main day shift supervisor was on vacation, so our boss on night shift decided she wanted to leave early. So she let us sneak off about two hours earlier than normal. So this would have been between 4.30 and 5 a.m. I was following a coworker down this country road as the warehouse was on the outskirts of my small rural town. I noticed that he hit his brakes and then proceeded to swerve off the road. I'm probably about a thousand feet behind him and I'm thinking to myself, what the heck is this dude doing? And that's when I saw it. There's this tall, dark shape strolling down the middle of the road in a hunched over and swaying side to side sort of manner. I've likened it to one of those tall windblower figures you see swaying at a car dealership or something, moving like that, very unnatural movements. I can't do it justice by describing it, as it would only really make sense if someone saw it for themselves like I did. It looked like a tall person wrapped up in a dark blanket or cloak. I had to hit the brakes and swerve too, but I came to a full stop. Whatever it was, I couldn't make out any features or characteristics. I saw a large torso with two legs. The upper half was hunched forward, as if it was leaning like an older person, you know, would with a walker. Now at the time, I was driving a 1998 Ford Explorer. I've looked up the height of that vehicle, and it lists around 67 inches. Whatever walked past my driver's window was a good foot or more higher than that, leaning forward. I believe whatever was walking was over seven foot tall minimum. Again, I could not see a head, any arms, it was just a figure with legs walking. My taillights illuminated it as I started to drive past. I couldn't make out any definite details of the body. I didn't see fur, skin, or anything like clothing. It was just solid. Not like translucent or anything, just large, thick, and black, or at the very least dark gray in color. My coworker had pulled over into the parking lot a little ways down the road, and I followed him in, and you could tell he was very scared. He was saying something along the lines of, what was that? It didn't have a head. Among a lot of other things most panicked people would say as well. We decided to drive back down and try to see if it's still there, and try to figure out what it actually is. This time I drove in front and he was following behind. We came up to the general area and I noticed there was a large black animal laying in the middle of the road. It appeared to be some kind of big black dog. Part of me knew this wasn't large enough to be what was walking in the road, but we had to stop because it was directly in the middle of the roadway. I decided to get out and walk up to it. All the while my coworker is yelling at me to get back in my vehicle. As I approach whatever was laying in the road, it brings its head up and looks at me. Its eyes were glowing yellow, which I wrote off as a shine from the headlights, but it growls. I stop dead in my tracks and just watch. This thing stands up on its back legs like a person, but falls back down. It sits back up and hobbles off to the side of the road like a wounded animal that wasn't able to use its front legs. It looked like your typical German Shepherd wolf type face, but its fur was puffy like a chow dog's. It was a lot bigger than most dogs, but still nowhere as tall as whatever that was walking down the road. I saw no blood or wounds, so I can't really say if it was actually hurt or not. My coworker got out of the car at this point, after it had disappeared into the wood line. We discussed what the heck just happened, and while we were talking, I noticed next to our feet was a mouse. It was just standing there with us, but it was cleaning itself. I nudged it with my shoe and it just kept cleaning its face, as if it wasn't afraid of us at all. The mouse was sitting in an upright position, as it was on its hind legs, using its front paws to wipe itself. I never really considered it until recently that all three of these bizarre happenings was on two legs. We got back into our vehicles and drove off, and then the next time at work, I mentioned what had happened to our coworkers, and of course they all laughed at us. So the other guy who saw it told me if I didn't stop talking about it, he's just going to start denying it, and it's best to just forget about the whole incident. So for essentially 15 years, I've never told anyone up until now. I've tried to rationalize it into something that makes sense, but even then it doesn't completely add up. 
I've tried to explain it away as just a large dog that must have gotten hit by another vehicle before my coworker and I got there. Maybe it was messing around with the mouse and it got hit, which broke its front legs and that's why I was trying to use its back legs. The mouse was traumatized from the dog trying to mess with it, so it was just standing there cleaning the dog slobber off itself. I, I don't know. That's the most plausible thing. The dog was nowhere near as tall as that thing was though. Even with the dog standing upright, it was close to six foot roughly, but whatever was walking had to have easily been over seven foot tall, as it was so much taller than my explorer, even with it hunched forward. I can halfway rationally explain away the dog and the mouse, but I can't explain what that was. So I'm back at square one trying to understand what that could possibly be. As someone who's always been very skeptical, it's very hard to accept the unacceptable. I've always been interested in weird creatures and such, but I never really truly believed they existed. I still struggle to believe that all these crazy stories could be true, yet who am I to say that they aren't, especially with this weird scenario that my former coworker and I went through that night. All I know is I know what I saw, but whatever I saw is something I don't know and probably never will. I know how crazy it sounds, and I personally would be hesitant to believe it if someone else told me this story, but it happened. One time I went to the bar with one of my friends. I had just turned 21, so I hadn't been to many bars, at least up until that point. My friend was drinking on the way to the bar, so he was already pretty drunk when we got there. When I sat at the bar, a cute girl came up and started talking to me and my friend. She said her name was Candace, and I noticed she had a really, really bright red hair. I assumed that she dyed it. I mean, it was pretty, but unnatural. Anyways, this girl was flirting with me and my friend. And I noticed that she could tell my friend was already very drunk. If I'm being honest, I played along like I was drunk already too, since it seemed to be working for my friend. I didn't know if she was just trying to get free drinks, so I just told her we didn't have much money. But then she offered to buy us drinks. She continued buying us drinks, and I was getting confused as to who she actually liked between me and my friend. My friend went to the bathroom. Before he came back, he was kicked out by the bouncers. He was too drunk. Candace and I went outside with him. She kept telling him to come home with her. He was so out of it, but he could even barely answer her. I told her he was too drunk, and I couldn't let him go anywhere. I didn't want him to wake up with a hangover in some random house with no car and no idea what happened. She kept pushing, though, saying that she would take care of him. But I told her no, because I had to stay with him. I was more sober than him and he was my responsibility. I told her that the only way he was going anywhere was if I tagged along. I assumed she thought I was jealous or just cock blocking my friend, but my friend could barely stand at this point and he'd obviously lost interest in her. She immediately started flirting with me and then offered to get my friend a taxi to drive him home and then said we could go to her place alone. At this point, I'd had a few drinks, and I was pretty buzzed, so I agreed. We took my friend to the taxi and walked to her car. I slightly stumbled on the way, and she said, Wow, you're pretty drunk, huh? As she smiled and held onto my arm. Yeah, I said. I don't know why, but I just felt slightly shy and just anxious in the moment. Everything was happening too easy for me, so it felt uneasy. We get to her car and drove down the street. Want to stop at the liquor store and get some more to drink? I'll buy it, so don't worry about paying. She offered. I didn't want to drink any more than I already had. I was already buzzed and wanted to be able to carry myself through the rest of the night. Sometimes I made myself look stupid when I'm drunk, so I didn't want to ruin anything with her more than I already did earlier, telling her my friend was too drunk. I told her I was already drunk enough, but she insisted. I didn't want to seem lame, so I told her to get me a pint of liquor with some apple juice to chase it. She went in the store and came out with a lot more than just a pint. 
I assumed that she wanted to drink more also, that's why she got a fifth instead of a pint. During the car ride, we passed the bottle back and forth, and she took these tiny little sips. I tried to take tiny sips, but she kept insisting, passing me the bottle to take a drink. I somehow managed to drink all of my apple juice, and just pretend to drink the bottle by spitting the liquor back in the apple juice bottle. I tossed the apple juice bottle full of liquor out the window before she saw it. I didn't want her to know that I was acting drunker than I actually was, and I think she believed that I was a sloppy drunk when I was just simply buzzed. I took a couple of more sips of liquor and then finished the bottle. Throughout the car ride, I called her the wrong name a couple of times to try to get a reaction out of her. She didn't react to it at all. She let me call her Carla without even correcting me. For some reason, I thought she lied to me about her name initially. We drove up to her house. I pretended to trip and stumble into her front door. She helped me inside by walking me and holding me up. She opened up her front door, which was unlocked. We walked into her house and she closed the front door and then locked it. I thought this was strange, but assumed she didn't want anyone walking in on us. I told her that I had to use the bathroom, so I walked into her bathroom, locked the door and then looked in the mirror. I just felt strange. I felt like something was just off. I felt myself becoming more drunk from finishing that bottle earlier. I turned on the sink to make noise and made myself puke up the liquor that I drank. I flushed and then went to the sink and started drinking the tap water out of my hands to help sober up. I just didn't want to be drunk but still wanted to hook up with Candace so I wanted to pretend to be drunk. I turned off the sink and I could hear her talking to someone. Yeah, he's drunk as hell. He can barely stand up. You do it. Who was she talking to and do what? I walked out of the bathroom and into the living room. The moment I stepped into the living room, I saw her walking into another room. All I could see was the back of her head. That strange, very bright red hair go into another room. I didn't see her face or anything. I just saw her kind of walk fast into the room. The living room was very dark. Hey, where are you going? I slurred like I was drunk. She walked back into the dark living room and up to me and said, Let's go in my room. I looked at her bright red hair and then into her eyes. They were different. Her face was different. It was another girl with the same hair. That's when I realized it was another girl with the same wig on. It was a wig the whole time. She had changed it with the other girl from earlier for whatever reason. My heart felt like it stopped, but I tried to look like I had no idea that it was a different girl. I kind of smiled at her, told her I needed to use the bathroom one more time, and that I was sorry I was just so drunk. She said, it's fine, just hurry up in there. I went into the bathroom and locked the door. I heard her whisper something to someone again this time, and this time I think I heard a male voice whisper back. I honestly didn't concentrate on listening to exactly what was said. Something sketchy was going on and I had to get the hell out of that house. I opened up the bathroom window and jumped straight out of it and then ran faster than I'd ever ran in my entire life. I didn't look behind me or anything. I just ran through the backyard, jumped the fence, ran through someone else's backyard, hit a road and ran towards the main road. I kept running down the main road until I saw a 24 hour convenience store. I ran inside and stood straight at the front of the store in front of the camera. I called the taxi and went home. I tried to think about what happened that night. What was she, or they, planning that night? Why did she tell me a fake name? Why was she trying to get my friend and I so drunk? I thought maybe a robbery, but she kept spending money on us. She kept buying us drinks, and even paid for my friend's taxi cab. Mostly, why did she wear a wig and then give it to another girl to wear? Who was she talking to? What did it all mean? And what was in that room they tried to lure me into? The next day after this incident, I went back to the house with a couple of friends just to see what was going on. No one was there. No cars, no people, nothing. Just an empty house. I ended up finding out that the house was a summer rental. 
And whoever those people were, they broke in and used it for that one night and that one night only, and then never came back. In the mid-90s, my parents took my older brother and me on vacation to Cancun, Mexico, when we were teenagers. I was 13 and my brother was 18. My brother and I shared a room. He was old enough to go out to the bars, leaving me alone in the room to watch movies and be bored out of my mind. My parents wanted to hang out with us the whole time, but we were too cool and tried to distance ourselves from them as much as we possibly could. I was mature for my age. I had previously had some underage drinks with my friends and felt that I was old enough and cool enough to go to the downtown bars of Cancun. When I asked my brother if I could join him, he laughed at me and told my parents. So I was really bitter that I had to stick back in the room, or worse, forced to hang out with my folks. So the third or fourth day into our vacation, I was sitting at one of the hotel bars, nursing a Shirley Temple, feeling sorry for myself. A woman, nicely dressed in her mid to late 20s, sat down next to me and we started chatting. I don't remember the details of what we talked about, I just remember her being really interested in what I had to say, and she made me feel like I was really mature for my age, what 13 year old me would have craved. We made arrangements to meet at the resort bar the next day, to hang out some more. So the next day comes, we meet in the resort lounge at lunchtime and hung out. She listened to my stories about how BS it was that I couldn't go out drinking, sympathizing with me. She then offered to get me alcoholic drinks. After three or four drinks, I was getting pretty drunk, and this was when she asked me if I wanted to go back to the room with her and hang out and watch a movie. Drunk 13-year-old me thought this was a great idea, as I was going to get some more booze and this cool 20-something chick wanted to hang out with me. I thought I was super cool. Just as we were leaving the lounge, my mom appeared. She was meeting my dad at the pool. My mom doesn't know what's going on and thinks I'm heading to my hotel room. Drunk me proudly introduces my new friend to my mom, telling her that we're going back to this woman's room to watch a movie. My mom's face goes from, hi, how's it going, to, get your ass up to your room right now. Mom tells the my new friend that she has no business inviting a 13-year-old back to her room and that she is not going to talk to me again, or she'll call the police. At that moment, I was so angry with my mom, but she had that don't mess with me look, so I knew I had to just keep my mouth shut. The next day, I was heading out to the pool, and saw that woman sitting at the bar with two men in their late 50s, who I can only describe as menacingly scary. She pointed at me, and one of the men glared while the other one winked at me. It sent shivers down my spine. I'm a long haul trucker. I see and deal with a lot of weird and scary stuff. I was traveling up US 93 in Nevada, heading to Portland for a delivery. It was around 1.30 in the morning and I needed to stop and log my half hour break. I found a wide spot and pulled off. I did my logs and then made myself a sandwich. While I was eating said sandwich, I noticed a vehicle pulling behind me. I didn't get too concerned about it, but kept one eye on it while I ate. Then it got kind of strange. I noticed a figure in the headlight of the vehicle approach the back, driver's side of my trailer, stop, and looked like he or she was rubbing the back or side of my trailer with their hand. Suspicious, for sure. I got my pistol out of my lockbox, cocked it, and loaded it. Slid it behind my waistband, then proceeded to climb out of my rig. I was walking about 10 feet back. I kept my hand on the butt of the pistol looked my flashlight on and aimed it at the person. It was a man. Weird looking fellow in a dirty whitish trench coat. Long straggly hair and bald on top. He was rubbing something on the side of my trailer. I hollered at him to stop what he was doing. He looked up at me and smirked. And without turning his gaze off of me, started walking toward me. I backed my way to the door. Keeping my hand on the pistol but not pulling it out yet. 
I didn't feel like my life was in danger at that moment. I opened up my door and climbed back into my rig. I shut the door and then locked it. The dude walked up to my door, looks up at me, still smirking. This dude is off his rocker. I'm thinking my half hour break is definitely over and it's time to go. However, I'm looking down at him and getting ready to turn the key. I feel my truck rock. I jump and look at my driver's side mirror. Nothing. I look over and check my passenger side mirror. And there, on my step, face pressed to my passenger side window, is a freaky, perfect replica of an old witch. Smiling with rotten teeth, cocking her head left and then right, bogging up my window. Needless to say, I about sucked my seat up my ass. And that's not the end of it. Oh no. The dude then jumps up on my driver's side step, proceeds to start licking my window. Then the witch lady starts smacking my window with the palm of her hand, over and over. Then the dude starts telling me to open up my door. Hey boy, open up. Come on now, open up. We're friendly. What you got in this trailer of yours? Anything good? Open up, boy. Now I feel threatened. I pull my pistol out and the chick immediately disappears off my passenger side step. The dude laughs, then jumps down and jumps off my step. Just grins, touches fingers to his nose, then jumps off my step again. I fired my truck up and took the hell off. Never did see any headlights following me, thank God. So to those disturbing travelers, yeah, let's not meet again. This was a very long time ago, so the timeline might be a little bit off and the details are fuzzy, but I've written it out exactly as I recall it. In the early 2000s, my family was living in Europe, and in December of 2001, we were coming back home to Latin America for a Christmas vacation. My brother and I and my dad were flying together from Paris to Miami. My dad was seated in business class while my brother and I were in coach, sitting in the middle two seats in the middle row. The flight was pretty normal at first, absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. About four or five hours into the flight, I was reading a book, almost dozing off when I heard a woman start to repeat the word no, over and over. At first it was really quiet, almost inaudible, but it quickly got very loud and urgent. Before I realized what was happening, she was screaming no, 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 at the top of her lungs. I looked up and saw a flight attendant a few rows ahead of me to the right, hunched over someone sitting in the window seat. My first thought was that the passenger was having a heart attack or a catastrophic health problem, but her yelling was so unsettling that that couldn't be it. There's a strange, long delay in people's reaction. Nobody did anything. I completely panicked and froze in my seat. My brother, on the other hand, jumped out of his seat, jumped over the person sitting next to him, and ran up to see what was going on. He was up there in a matter of seconds, and as he approached, suddenly everyone around us stood up to see what was going on and or to try to help. She kept screaming over and over. She was struggling with this passenger. He was really tall, so tall that his whole head was visible over the back of the seat. He had very long, black curly hair. Our brother came back to our row and said, something is wrong before going back up to get a closer look. Passengers close to her began struggling with the guy as well. A bunch of people jumped on him and started pulling at him. Someone in the row behind him even pulled his hair back so hard his face jerked towards the top of the plane. He let out a really loud moan or scream, and then it was chaos. The aisles were so crowded nobody could move, and I saw a fire extinguisher being passed hand to hand the back of the plane. I immediately thought that there was a fire and that we were all going to die. It was an incredibly hopeless sensation to know that there's nowhere to run and no way to escape the situation unfolding right in front of you. They passed the extinguisher all the way up to a male flight attendant near that guy. The flight attendant hit him with the butt of the extinguisher really hard on the face. They started asking for belts, headphones, straps, etc., anything they could do to restrain him. 
My brother took off his belt and gave it to them. They wrapped everything they could around that passenger's arms, shoulders, and torso, securing him to that seat. I saw the male flight attendant who had hit him with the fire extinguisher carry a large black tennis shoe to the back of the plane, which at the time seemed kind of strange and I really didn't think much of it. The flight attendants asked if there was a doctor on board to sedate the man. People kept asking if there was a flight marshal on board too, but nobody came forward. I can't remember exactly how or when things calmed down, but eventually everyone was told to return to their seats. A small group of the people that had helped restrain the man were asked to keep guard on a rotation. There were always at least a few people sitting behind him or next to him, keeping an eye on him the entire time. I think there was even someone behind him holding a fistful of his hair for the rest of the flight. The pilot announced over the PA system that there had been a security breach. I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was vague, and that we were being diverted to Boston Logan Airport. He said they didn't know if the person was working alone, so get to know your neighbor. We were in the middle of the Atlantic, with maybe four more hours to go before we landed. Things were a bit ominous and tense, but for the most part, everyone was friendly and in a pretty good mood. Nobody really knew exactly what had happened. We weren't allowed to get up from our seats. If you had to use the bathroom, you needed to call a flight attendant to escort you to the bathroom where you weren't allowed to lock the door either. I remember a grumpy old man in a few rows from us who got really annoyed after a while and kept getting up without permission just to annoy the flight attendants. They were not happy. After a while, they put on the movie Legally Blonde to distract everyone. My brother and I went up to business class to talk to my father. Apparently, they didn't hear the extent of the chaos back in coach. They were all going on about business as usual. A few hours later, as we approached the U.S., we saw fighter jets outside the window on both sides of the plane. The pilot announced that they were escorting us back to Boston. A few little kids got really excited watching those jets. I learned later that these are the last resort security measure to prevent hijacked planes from repeating 9-11 style attacks. They were supposed to shoot us down in case of a major threat. We landed and were told to stay seated. A SWAT team came on board carrying assault rifles and a ton of body armor, cut off all the guy's restraints, and took him off the plane. I saw everything in detail, since we were seated only a few seats behind him. We were parked in the middle of the tarmac for a long time before we were allowed to disembark. I remember seeing pieces of my brother's belt on the guy's seat as we left, and thought about taking one as a souvenir, but thought better of it. We were escorted to a baggage claim area in the Boston Logan Airport that was surrounded by a large metal fence to keep us all in one place. We were there for what felt like three or four hours, just waiting anxiously. No one would explain anything to us. Passengers were getting really agitated, shaking the metal fences and yelling at the airport personnel that this was inhumane treatment. There's no food, nowhere to sit. Children were crying. Dozens of people were trying to sleep on the baggage carousel. They finally ordered a bunch of pizzas and led us into the waiting area with actual chairs, where each passenger was interrogated by the FBI. They were astonishingly unfriendly. I guess they were trying to discern if the guy had any partners on board. They then shuttled us back to our baggage, where security officers thoroughly hand-searched every single passenger's shoe, suitcase, and carry-on bags, and then patted everyone down. We were finally allowed to make a phone call and I called my mom. The rest of the family was completely hysterical. They'd been watching the news all day and knew that an Islamic extremist had tried to blow up our flight with a bomb that he'd smuggled on board inside his shoe. We had absolutely no idea what had really happened until this moment as we were kept completely in the dark. It was a very strange sensation. Up until this point, my dad, brother, and I had actually remained pretty relaxed considering the circumstances. We were more annoyed about the inconvenient changes to our travel itinerary than the crazy experience on that plane. We had no idea how bad the security breach really was, how close we came to being killed. After about 12 hours in Boston, we were put on another flight home. My brother made the mistake of giving a few interviews to CNN and other networks while we were in Boston. So when we landed in our small country, he was immediately swarmed by the press, 
and gave a bunch of interviews despite being exhausted. I was happy to finally sit and relax with my family after the longest and most stressful trip of my life. We later learned that the bomber, Richard Reed, had actually tried to board the same flight on the previous day. He was detained and questioned by French security because of multiple red flags. He had no luggage and purchased a one-way ticket with cash, causing him to miss the flight. They put him on the next day's flight, put him up in a hotel kind of far from the airport, since everything nearby was booked. The following day it rained, and on the walk from the hotel to the airport, his shoes got wet. This might have been why he had trouble lighting the wick that was inside his shoe. He was planning to light it mid-flight. He waited until the passenger next to him went to the bathroom, then tried to light his shoe with matches. The female flight attendant that first engaged him had smelled the matches and was walking up and down the aisle looking for a passenger who she assumed was trying to smoke a cigarette. She saw him with a shoe in his lap and immediately tried to take it from him. They struggled and he bit her hand. Reed is now serving three life terms in prison. Not really sure how to begin this, and my title may make more sense after reading my experience. I'll try to be as brief and concise as possible. It was the summer of 2004. My family was supposed to vacation in Kennebunkport, Maine. My father was stuck in meetings, so he was going to come up from Manhattan a few days after us. My mother wanted to drive up, which super annoyed me at the time, but we didn't have much of a choice, so me, my brother, and my sister loaded up into the car and started that drive. I was about 14 at the time of this story. The drive itself was uneventful, but there were various delays and we ended up getting a lot later than we originally planned. Because of this, the owners of the house we were renting had turned in for the night, and we weren't able to get a hold of them to get the keys to get inside. It sounds like horrible planning, but apparently they were pretty strict about the time frame to pick up the keys. My mom, who was unfazed, decided that she wanted lobster, so we all went to one of our favorite spots. She called my dad to see if he could make reservations at a hotel in Kennebunkport from New York while we ate. We were just enjoying the lobster while a guy came up and started chatting with my mom. I figured it was just a friendly local making conversation. During this, my dad calls my mom and my mom excuses herself to speak to him. Apparently, all hotels were booked for the night. Go figure. I hide the vacation season in Kennebunkport. The plan was for us to drive to the nearest town and just find somewhere to stay until we picked up the keys for our vacation home. Apparently that local had been listening to my mom's conversation and came back over once she got off the phone. I want to say first that there was nothing outwardly off about this guy. He was preppy, clean cut, unassuming and fit in with the clientele. He told my mom that he had a big home with a big guest house we were more than welcome to stay with. His wife wouldn't mind. Immediately, my reaction was like, F that. No way in the world I was staying at a random dude's house in creepy Maine in the dark. My mom, doing her due diligence, determined that this guy was legit. He said he was in finance, and my mom was an investment banker. They chatted long enough for my mom to determine that he wasn't totally full of it. I called my dad hysterical. He said that I was overreacting and that I needed to get out of the city more and just accept that sometimes people are just nice. So my brother, sister and I got into our car and followed this man back to his house. The guest house was really nice, fully furnished, but the beds were oddly placed. The guest house had two bedrooms and instead of the beds being located in the middle or center, they were right under each window. It just seemed out of place. So anyway, fast forward, we're all getting ready for bed and my mom hears a knock on the door and it's that guy. He said he just wanted to check to make sure we got all settled in. Cool. Nice thing to do, I guess. Then about 30 minutes later, he comes back to check in again. At this point, my mom was like, thanks, we're good. We'll stop by in the house in the morning to say thank you, etc. Fast forward another 30 to 45 minutes. I can't sleep. I'm terrified. We hear this rustling, which is odd because the guest house was nowhere near any trees or even close proximity to bushes that might cause such a noise. At this point, I see my mom wide awake. 
look up out the window, like motioning towards the window with her eyes. Let me add, none of the windows had curtains. The guy said it's because his wife was in the process of redecorating. When I looked up there, there was a male figure just standing. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I don't know how long he was standing there for. When he walked away, my mom waited a bit, then told us to get our stuff together. She wasn't messing around. We had my dad on the phone at this point. He was pretty much flipping out at my mom about something, but I didn't hear what. My mom said she was going to go put the stuff in the car and to follow her out. This was all around 2 a.m. When we got into the car, we pulled around to the front of the main house. So my mom could return to the key and say thanks and just get out of there. However, when we got to the front, all the lights were off. Not just all the lights, but it looked like no one had been home. Porch light, table lamp in the front windows, everything black. Also, the two cars were gone, and which we had presumed to be his wife's car. After seeing this, my mom at this point was pretty unsettled. She said that we were just going to leave and proceeded to drive to the gate. The gate at the end of the driveway had been deadbolted and padlocked shut from the inside. It wasn't a super strong gate, so my dad just told her to rev it. Thankfully, we were in a big SUV and just got out of there. We drove straight back to New York City, not speaking the entire time, and we have never returned back to Maine. My parents still refuse to speak about it to this day. I ended up asking a family member about it one night when he was drunk, and he said, Oh, they didn't tell you? The actual owners of that house were on vacation. I'm assuming my mom or dad followed up with one of the local authorities and figured that out, but never told us that. I don't know who that man was, or what he was planning that evening. I was curious as to whether there were any known serial killers or murderers who were in that area at the time, whether traveling through or whatever. For the record, I'm a female and I'm turning 19 this year, and the story happened when I was around 15. Also, I'm from France, which can explain why my English mistakes, if there is any. When I was 15 years old, I had just gotten into my junior year, and I created my first Twitter account that I deleted because of the story. For some information, I didn't tell anyone my username, neither my family nor my friends because I didn't really have any. My profile picture was an avatar, so there's no pictures of me on that account. And as location, I said Paris because I lived in the suburbs. I didn't have many followers, 20 or maybe 30. I didn't know that many people, so it's not really that interesting. One evening in October, someone sent me this quite strange direct message. It was someone with 200 followers on this account, and the message said, Hi, my name is Rob. I just turned 17 and wanted to know if you lived in the area, because I'll soon be moving in, and go to the town high school. I'm looking for friends. I immediately thought that something was wrong because there was nowhere on my profile that said where I actually lived. But after I spent some time thinking, I remembered of a tweet I'd made weeks ago about buses and I mentioned the city. So I told myself that he looked up the town and just found my tweet. His age wasn't shocking because I'm two years ahead of my classmates. I was bored and he was polite. So I answered him and I told him that I did leave in that town and go to that high school the discussion was natural. We talked a lot that night, mainly about high school and about the food at the cafeteria, about the teachers, that kind of thing. It was getting very late though, and he tried to interpose some personal questions like, do you live far away from the school? Are you in a house or an apartment? Do you live with both parents? There's five of you. You're not often home alone. I never answered because it was way too shady for me, and unfortunately, he didn't insist. Unfortunately, because if he did, I would have probably blocked him. The next day, same thing. We talked a lot. He was still asking all kinds of personal questions to quote unquote get to know me better. So I ended up asking some too. And he always seemed to answer with what seemed like honesty. I still didn't know the answers to questions about my house though. Because he definitely didn't need to know anything about that. It lasted two or three weeks, but it was enough time for me to develop feelings for him. 
He was handsome, super kind, and it was everything that I needed because I'd been bullied for years. And even today, I still develop strong feelings, but mostly blind trust in people who are just friendly to me. In France in October, we have two weeks long vacation. And the day before back to school, he finally told me he was coming to my neighborhood because he finally moved in with his mom. And he asked me a place to meet during the morning break. I was so happy and relieved to finally be able to meet him and told him to just join me in the hall. In the hall. But when he understood that there would be people around us, he said he would prefer to meet in an isolated place because he was afraid he would not recognize me and didn't want to spend the break looking for me. It was a good enough excuse for me, so I told him to meet me in the third floor bathroom because we weren't allowed to stay there during the breaks and no one would disturb us. In my head, even though it was a little creepy, I was still in school, so nothing could happen to me. Next day, back to school day. I made myself pretty. I wore my best clothes. I counted down the minutes. And finally, when break time arrived, I ran to the bathroom and waited. When he arrived, it was him. He was not a catfish. He looked quite like his profile picture. But I noticed that he had seemed a lot older than he told me. I thought 20 years old instead of 17. We talked a lot, we got along well, and I was so pleased. And at the end of the break, he asked me to go to the fast food chain with him, just for lunch. I said no because I didn't have any money, and I always refused for people to pay for me. It's just out of principle. He seemed disappointed, but offered to walk me home after classes. I explained I have to take the bus, but that he could walk me to the bus stop. He looked disappointed again, but finally accepted this. And that's exactly what happened. It was so great that it quickly became some sort of routine. We would meet in the third floor bathroom during morning break, and he would walk me to the bus stop after classes. Big surprising fact, I never saw him in the hallways, nor at the cafeteria. But I thought at the time that the building was huge. There was over 1,500 students in here. So if our schedules didn't coincide, there's no way we couldn't meet each other. This little game lasted until December, so almost a month and a half. The 14th of December, a Thursday, I complained about how lonely I was going to be that evening because my dad was abroad for work. My brother was always at his friend's house, and my little sister was on a school trip, and my mother had to work very late that night. It was very reckless of me, but after weeks, I thought I could trust him. That evening, he walked me to the bus stop. We both waited. I got in the bus, waved at him, and put on my earphones. I had two stops before my house, and it was about 1745 in December, so it was already really dark outside. And as I got on the bus, I just had this really bad feeling. There was that very uncomfortable sensation on my stomach, and I felt like I was being observed. I pressed pause on my music, but kept my earphones on so that people thought I couldn't hear anything. And I think that's what probably saved my life. I live in a suburban neighborhood, very silent, especially at night, with no visibility on the big road the bus passed in. When I heard footsteps behind me and understood why I was right, there was definitely someone following me, and he was not well intentioned. At least I could hear that was not accelerating, so he was not trying to catch up to me. But I couldn't guess how long it would last. As quietly as possible, I reached for my keys in my pocket, and when I finally pulled them out, I ran. I ran as fast as I could. Best sprint of my life. I don't know how it worked, but I managed to open up and close the door before he could reach me. I then deactivated my alarm, which by the way, confirmed that I was home alone. Then I took a look through the glass panel on the door. It's not a peephole, it's a whole window. So if someone wanted to see what was happening inside, they definitely could. It was Rob, a few meters away looking at me with a really creepy face. He had followed me to my home, probably with a car, and he was clearly not here for chit chat. I still don't know why I didn't call the police, I was just totally paralyzed. We both stared at one another for a minute. When I took back control over my body, I ran into the kitchen to get a knife, and then got to the back door. He was there too, banging on the door. I feared for a few seconds that the glass would break, but thankfully that didn't happen. That moment, when I was pushing against the door and praying for it not to break, all the while he was kicking harder and harder, 
was the longest that I've ever experienced. After maybe five minutes, he stopped and got around the house, knocking against every shutter, and then got back to the front door. He looked very angry. But then, my neighbor's car reached my house, and Rob quickly ran away, probably thinking it was my mother coming home. Back on Twitter the following day, Rob sent me thousands of messages before I could block him. He then deleted his account. I thought I was done with this story. I really did. But quickly after, some accounts which have just been created then followed me. All of their ads were series of numbers and the first letter of his name. As soon as I blocked one, another one would follow me. I just chose to delete my account because I couldn't make it stop. It was much too hard to endure because they were sending me dozens of insulting DMs. Later, I talked to the people who were supposedly Rob's classmates because I haven't met any in days. But not a single one had ever even heard about Rob. This guy was never a student in my high school. That is why I never met him apart from our daily meetings. And that's probably why he seems so old. I never heard about him anymore. And I'm still asking myself, what did he want? And what could have happened that night if he got inside? I used to work on the north slope of Alaska in the oil industry. The work we were doing required us to travel far out into the Alaskan Petroleum Reserve, which is basically just untamed tundra wilderness for hundreds and hundreds of miles. The oil companies would build these long icy roads in the winter that would lead to drilling pads. Our job was to go out after they finished the initial drilling and test rock formations for their oil producing qualities. It was mid-January. The sun hadn't come quite up yet. And when I say the sun hadn't come up, I mean in almost a month and a half. Polar nights are intense. The particular well site that we were traveling to was about 60 miles west of Alpine, Alaska, deep inside the wilderness. Our job took a week, but we finished and we were headed back to the camp to finish our hitch and just go home. At the beginning and end of the icy roads are guard shacks that you have to check in and out for safety. There's no cell reception and radios work only up to a distance. If you don't check in or out at a set time, they come looking for you to ensure that you're not a popsicle. It was about four in the morning, not that it really mattered in the land of endless night, and we were halfway across the ice road. Travel was slow, as the speed limit on the roads is only 25 miles per hour, when something appeared on the road in our headlight. It was a man in jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie jacket, walking down an ice road in wilderness tundra at 4 a.m., and it was negative 20 degrees outside. It's not unusual for the local Inuit people to be out this far hunting. Maybe his snowmobile broke down and he's trying to get back to the guard shack. Seemed plausible. He did acknowledge us as our truck rolled up next to him. He just kept shuffling forward. He didn't seem cold, his clothing, while totally not appropriate for this extreme weather, appeared warm and dry. We also noticed he wasn't Inuit, but Caucasian. I rolled down my window and asked if he needed any help and if he was okay. He didn't acknowledge us, just kept shuffling forward. His face was completely blank, devoid of any thought or emotion. The other guys in my truck suggested that maybe he was in an accident and is still in shock. I continued rolling my truck alongside him as he trudged down the road, still trying to get his attention. But in this extreme cold, I would occasionally get whiffs of a peculiar smell coming off of him. He smelled acidic, if that makes any sense. There was just a lot about this guy that made the hair on my neck stand up. The guy behind me in the truck's crew cab had enough of all this. He rolled down his window and reached out to grab the guy. He later said that he was going to try and shake him out of this stupor. Before my buddy's hand could reach him, though, this walking popsicle spun around and latched onto my buddy's outstretched arm. He glared at my buddy, and then at me with this look of pure rage, not removing his hand from his arm. If emotions had a physical temperature, this guy could have melted the entire tundra that night. My buddy groaned out in pain as if he was trying to get his arm free from Mr. Popsicle. At that moment, 
This guy just starts screaming in our faces. There was so much hate and rage and anger in that scream. It was absolutely terrifying. I slammed on the gas and spun out on the ice for a second before the wheels caught and launched us forward. Popsicle dude still had a hold of my buddy's arm and was trying to pull him out of the truck. He was running alongside the truck while the other guys in the cab held onto my buddy's arm, keep him inside. After several moments, it could have been an only a few seconds at the most, my buddy tore free from this guy and we hauled ass to the guard shack another 30 miles down the road. We checked in with the guards and reported what we'd just seen. The guard was looking at us like we were pulling some sort of prank, but the policy stated they had to check it out regardless. My buddy's arm was sore and when he pulled back his sleeve, there were noticeable bruises in the shape of a hand around his arm. We filed a report with the guard and were told to head back to our camp. None of us really wanted to talk about what happened and it was a quiet drive the rest of the way. We flew home the next day as well. The next time we saw the guard at his shack, we asked him if he ever saw Mr. Popsicle on his patrols. He told us they searched up and down that ice road for a solid 12 hour shift, saw nothing, not even tracks in the snow leading off the road. He told us it was a good prank and he'd be getting us back for making him waste a shift driving around. But it wasn't a prank. Who would even make up a story like that? Who would willingly bruise their arm for a dumb prank? We never got a satisfying answer to what happened that evening, and I still wonder about that dude, if it even was a dude. The Alaskan Tundra is a weird place, and that was just one of my many weird stories from my time up there. I'll work to write down more of my experiences and share them to the appropriate subs. My family loves to go on vacation in Sweden, and my grandmother even has a cottage in the forest that all family members can use if they want. A couple of years ago, when I was around 20, I was on vacation there with my mom and grandma, sometime in autumn for about 10 days. This is the Swedish backwoods. We go there to unwind, to enjoy nature and take a rest from civilization. Hiking, canoeing, foraging for mushrooms, sitting around the fireplace in the evening, that sort of thing. It's not completely isolated. You can find some villages and fields here and there, but it's definitely very rural, even though you don't have to encounter any people if you don't want to. Now, I've always liked to go exploring on my own, finding new paths through the woods, fixing our old maps to better reflect the current landscape. The maps you can buy of this area haven't been updated in ages, and many paths don't even exist anymore because nature has swallowed them a long time ago. What I really like is exploring abandoned buildings, and rural Sweden is really great for that. Back in the 1800s, Swedish people in their countryside were dirt poor and starving, so many moved to the new world in search of a better life. You can still find the foundations of old farmhouses, even the foundations of entire small villages in the woods, sometimes with rusted 100 plus year old farm equipment. Also, like many other countries, Sweden has an issue with rural exodus nowadays. Middle-aged and younger people move away to the cities. Old people stay until they die and nobody buys the house. And it just sits there, abandoned. This happens a lot. You can find many empty houses in the forest. And I just love sneaking around in them. Most of them have already been looted. Presumably by hunters, loggers, or other hikers. But sometimes, you can still find interesting things... And I like not having to worry about being seen, because it's so rare to meet anyone out in those woods. So one crisp autumn day, I took one of our bicycles and a map. GPS is not really a thing out there. My phone. And something to eat and drink. Told my mom and grandma I wanted to be back by nightfall at the latest, and then just set out to explore. On the map, I had chosen a wide loop that I guessed would take about three hours if paths were clear. And if I didn't stop to explore. But even if I did... I guess that I still had plenty of time until dusk. I had a lot of fun at first, driving the mountain bike down smaller and smaller forest paths, finding some old foundations of old buildings and some root cellars that were still intact and some mushrooms. I had some problems with the map though, because like I said, 
Many paths that are still on the map don't exist anymore. So I had to turn back a few times. But mostly, I had a pretty good idea of where I was. Of course, that made it all take longer than I anticipated. When I reached the furthest point of the loop and turned into a narrow path, that according to the map would take me back an hour. The sun was already pretty low in the sky at this point too. I started feeling a bit uneasy. I have to admit, because of my bad time management, I was worried that I couldn't trust the map even less than I thought now. Also, shortly before turning onto that path, I'd found some traps in the woods that kind of creeped me out. There were the three big cages, each with a platform in the middle that was connected to a steel door on the front. On those platforms were small animal remains, rotten black with little bones sticking out, bait that hadn't been touched. I took a stick and deactivated the traps by pushing onto the platform through the cage bars. When those doors had snapped shut, it had been so loud that I flinched and afterwards I noticed how quiet it really had become. Now I was clumsily cycling all over that uneven ground, and the sun was now setting. I had this uncomfortable feeling that everything around me was sort of aware, if that makes any sense. It wasn't the feeling of being watched, not quite yet. It just felt like I had to try and be quiet somehow. After a while, I came upon a crossroad in a more open area where I was supposed to follow the path straight on. The trees were not so high here, and I guess this had been one of the clearings created by a severe storm ten years back. At the crossroads was a tiny wooden building somewhere between a shed and a cabin. I had originally set out to find abandoned houses, and so far, I'd only seen a couple of stone foundations and a roof cellar. So even though at this point I really should have hurried to get back, curiosity got the better of me. I wanted to check if this thing was locked and see if I could take a peek inside. It wasn't locked, but the door was kind of stuck in the frame. Inside the cabin was a cot, a tiny oven, and a bigger mass of taxidermy animals that I could have thought would fit into the small thing. They were even on the cot and on the oven, and they nailed to the ceiling and the walls. And the entire inside of the cabin, almost every inch of it, was just covered in layer after layer of black mold. It was so much that with some of the animals, you couldn't tell any more what they'd been once. With others, I could only guess from the shape. They all looked monstrous, covered in that stuff, and the smell of rot and mold was overwhelming. I quickly tried to close the door again, but the wood had warped so much that it wasn't possible, so I just left it hanging slightly open and just got out of there. Alrighty as I was cycling away from the cabin, I felt strange. This time I did feel like I was being watched. I was nonsensically thinking, you should have closed the door, you should have closed the door. I don't know why I thought that, but it made me uneasy to think that the shed was now open. I told myself, you're just being silly, because why the hell would it matter? Obviously, no one was using that cabin anymore. Maybe ten minutes later, the path entered a stretch of older woods with much higher trees. The sun was now close to the horizon, and the sky was full of orange light. Under the fir trees, it was already getting very dark. I checked my phone to maybe tell my mom that I might be late, but of course, I still had no reception. A couple of more minutes into the dark forest... The path disappeared. At this point, I only had two options. Try to push through with my bike until I met a logging road that was hopefully on the other side of the stretch of the woods and could take me back. Or return, go past the mold shed again, and then try to get back the way I'd come. Basically, the second option was not an option for me. As I already said, I kind of had to zigzag and improvise to even come this far because the map was wrong in so many places. Going back all the way would take ages. I could get turned around in the dark and easily lose my way. But also, and really, I didn't want to go past that shed again. I just had this sudden aversion to even look behind me. As dusk was creeping through the forest, I was getting properly paranoid at this point. An uneasy feeling crystallized into the idea that I disturbed something inside there. And that because I left the door open, Something had now come out of the shed and was following me. I knew the whole thing was stupid, but I couldn't shake that feeling. Going past the shed, past those traps, and then through the ruins of that old village, past the open mouse of the roost cellar, in the dark, 
and getting lost out there with the feeling of something possibly on my trail, no way was I going back that way. Yes, I might even get lost trying to go through those woods in front of me. I would have to push and maybe even carry my bike. But the woods didn't seem to stretch too far in front of me, only left and right. So it seemed like the only option. I was just hoping at this point that the supposed logging road on the other side was still there. After tearing through brambles for a bit, I found what I guessed might be the remnants of the old path because the ground was sort of lower there. I tried to follow that until I came upon another set of ruins. Again, the foundations of some farmhouse, presumably. Behind that, the ground sloped down into a marshy area and birches that seemed white in the gloom under the trees. At this point, I stopped to listen, but I still didn't want to turn around. I couldn't hear anything, but the ugly feeling of being watched, of being followed, only increased. And at this point, I felt like not only was something coming after me, but like the forest itself was sort of aware of my presence, listening maybe, or watching, like it was being deliberately quiet. I was feeling so scared that I didn't even try to talk myself out of this feeling anymore. I just accepted that this was what I was dealing with now. I had some leftover food in my backpack, a half a sandwich and some sesame snacks, and then of course the mushrooms that I'd found earlier. I took all of it out, laid it on a stone on one of the old walls that surrounded the ruins. I said something to the effect of, please let me go, I'm really sorry, I won't come back here, I promise. Just let me go home. Something like that. After that, I grabbed my bike and went down into the swamp, still not looking back. Luckily, it turned out it wasn't a large swamp or anything, just a wet patch for about 200 meters until the ground sloped upwards again. Still, it took a while because of the bike, which I had to push and carry by turn, because I really couldn't see anymore was constantly stepping into muddy pools and getting stuck. When I emerged on the other side, I was soaked in sweat, and my feet were wet and muddy to mid-calf. I still stopped frequently to listen for any sounds behind me, but there was nothing. And then, wouldn't you know it, the trees opened up and there it was, the logging road. I could have cried with joy and relief in that moment. I stepped onto the road and turned back to look behind me, but I couldn't even see the swamp through the trees anymore. It was almost completely dark at this point. Luckily, there was some moonlight, and the light on the bike also worked. I climbed on my bike and pedaled home as fast as I could. About a half an hour later, I even had some cell phone reception for a moment, so I could call my mom and tell her about what happened. Well, I told her I got lost anyway. I didn't want her to know how I'd worked myself up into a panic over nothing. Of course, she'd already been worried, and the horrible feeling I had back there deep in those woods eased up gradually. I even heard an owl and saw a deer later. By the time I arrived back at our cabin, I was finally feeling okay again. Just extremely exhausted. So here's what I think happened. I got worried because I was out in the forest later than I planned, then got spooked by the ugly sight within the cabin, and at this point, basically drove myself into hysteria because of my overactive imagination and my inexperience with the forest at night. There was nothing there that wasn't explainable. Even the dead silence was probably a period in between the songbirds going to sleep for the night and the nocturnal animals coming out. All the rest, I think, was just in my head. That's why I think it was a good idea to leave the food as my sacrifice. It's like a placebo, almost. A fantasy solution to a fantasy problem that worked to calm myself down. But even so, I've never been back to that stretch of woods, and I won't ever go there out again. I can never be 100% sure that there was truly nothing out there, and I don't ever want to have an experience like that again. If there is in fact something not quite right with this area, I don't want to find out what that is. My girlfriend at the time went camping five hours away from her home for her birthday and our anniversary. We made the trip after a big storm had passed through. We left town early and got there early in the afternoon. The guy at the entrance to the campground mentioned there was no one else staying there that weekend, so we are like, oh, this is going to be sick. 
First, we drove down these long pathways to our designated area. As you got close to it, the road narrowed. So basically, you had to back out to get out. We unloaded the car, got the tent set up, and decided to walk around the woods. It was dead silent, but it was still bright out, so we just took in the nature and walked a few miles away. We reached this point in the woods where there were some weird looking white cabins. They were all uniform, all built the same exact way. Like, I guess they were part of some camping grounds, but they seemed way, way out of the way. There's no sign of life either. It just felt eerie to be at, like we shouldn't be there. So we turned around and walked back. We took a breather in our tent, then tried to start a fire in the fire pit. Unfortunately, neither of us had ever been camping before and had no idea how to start a fire. We had brought some of those self-lighting logs from Walmart and some lighter fluid, but everything around us was soaked to the bone from the rain, and that had passed through the day before. We knew we needed kindling of some sort, but any dry sticks or leaves was far and few between. Eventually, we got a small fire going, ate some hot dogs and marshmallows, and just spent some time looking at the stars. Then we noticed just how dark it was out there. My girlfriend was easily spooked and was just like, Hey, can we go back into the tent now? So I put the fire out and we crawled back into the tent. We were talking to each other, but I could tell she was tense. Then suddenly, she put her hand over my mouth and was like, Shh, you hear that? Before I could respond, we both heard footsteps, like heavy footsteps. It sounded like a group of people walking. I just whispered to her, it's, it's probably just animals or something. Then we heard mumbling, like low mumbling. We couldn't make out words, but it didn't sound like a sound that animals could make. It sounded like words, but hushed and non-elaborated. We sat there in silence, staring at one another in the dark for what felt like forever. The mumbling got louder, as did the footsteps, until it sounded like it was right outside of our tent. We both froze. I don't think either of us were breathing. And then, silence. We waited and waited and waited. I'm still not sure how much time passed and eventually my girlfriend said, we have to get back to the car. So with our adrenaline pumping, I peek out of the tent into the darkness and told her to stay behind me. Then we ran to the car. I locked the doors and she was like, what was that? We're not staying here. No one is out here but us. What was that? I kept looking around for any signs of life, but we were still seemingly alone. I looked at her and was like, okay, I'm just going to grab our stuff. You stay in the car. We only had our ice chest and our tent out, so I hopped out and ran, grabbed the chest, and then tossed it into the back seat. As I turned around to get the tent, I started hearing footsteps closing in again. In a moment of pure terror, I yanked the tent out of the ground, wrapped the tarp up in it, and slung it over my shoulder like some panicked Santa Claus, and then shoved it into the trunk as well. I didn't say anything when I got into the car except, do we have everything in here? My girlfriend said yes and I floored it. We came to a fork in the road that went like six different directions and I asked my girlfriend if she remembered which path we came down just to get here and she told me she didn't know. We chose a random one and ended up in a different camping spot. Cursing under my breath I slammed it into reverse again. Thankfully I noticed the angle we had exited from and I could see the main path back to the gate. As we hightailed it out of there. I noticed there was a single, small green light out into the woods to our right, near where our designated spot was. We drove the entire five hours back to our hometown and fell asleep on my girlfriend's parents' couch around 4 a.m. We never talked about that trip ever again, and I myself have had no desire to camp since. First, let me set up some background to make the flow of the story smoother. This happened almost 19 years ago. I was nearly 13 years old and being raised by my grandparents. 
We lived in this little tourist town in Florida. They had problems with their two daughters as adults, my mother being the older of the two, and they wanted to do everything that they could to make sure that I didn't turn out the same way. A do-over, if you will. So needless to say, they were very, very strict. My aunt was having a good period. She had her stuff together. We were all very close. My aunt understood what it was like to be raised under a glass dome, metaphorically speaking. They raised her too, after all. So being as she was my only aunt, she made sure that the time we spent together was always super cool. I would stay over on Saturday nights. We would go out and hang out at the pier. And she would let me hang out with my middle school boyfriend, who would always find ways to get to wherever I was. My grandparents had no idea about any of these activities, of course. I was just spending some quality time with my aunt and giving them a break. It was nice that I had a young female figure since my mom wasn't around. So one night, we were out having fun, and my aunt meets this guy and they really hit it off. He was actually very nice and introduced himself to me. He went by JR and at first was a very kind and charming talker. They exchanged numbers after hanging out for a while, then we both went to home and went to bed. They ended up going out a bit more and my aunt really liked this guy. He took her to his house and introduced her to his father, showed her around his land. He lived out in the woods in the middle of nowhere. I've lived in this town for 30 years and still to this day couldn't tell you where exactly that is. I was only there once. He was teaching my aunt how to shoot a gun. I remember her shoulder rocking back and forth with the impact of the shot and it surprising her. He had these weird flamingo dancing clothes in his closet. It was all just seemingly harmless, but everyone has their corks. About 10 days, maybe two weeks later, we were out there again by the pier, out by the payphones just talking about what to do that night, maybe what to get for dinner. JR and my aunt were in their late 20s, early 30s, and as much as she loved me, I imagine there was times that I got in the way. So anyway, we were at the pier. He's talking about how he has all these painkillers. He offered me one. I declined, of course, and told him I had a high tolerance to pain anyway. I didn't need it. He then, with a huge smile, asks me if he can see for himself, assuring me he won't really hurt me. He's just trying to have fun. This guy twists my arm behind my back until I hear a pop. I start to cry, and he laughs and says, Aw, oh, sweetheart, I was only playing. You said you had a high tolerance. I guess I'm stronger than I thought I was. I'm sorry. No need to ruin the good time we're all having. I end up going into the private peer office, which my granddad managed, still crying. My aunt comes in and lets me know that she thinks it's really messed up, and she talks to him about it. She goes back outside and he asks what she's up to that night. She tells him he isn't sure if I'm staying over because of what just happened. I was really wanting to go home. I was also pissed that she hadn't decked him right there for hurting me. He tells her that she should meet him under, let's call it the Sunset Bridge at 2am on the other side of town. He says that the stars are really beautiful and you can listen and hear the fish. He tells her he would love to see it with her and they can dance under the moon. We're all from this fishing family and live in a fishing town so fish activities under a bridge late at night wasn't necessarily something that threw up a red flag. If it's dark and late, there won't be people hogging up all the fish. She tells him maybe and we leave. I decide to spend the night after all, later sneaking in only if she'll pick up my boyfriend Charlie. She calls him when she got home and she says that she can come, but she's going to have me with her. He groans and is like, fine. All right, I guess she can come. Maybe if she gets tired, she can just sleep in the car. About an hour after she called JR the first time, I ask her about Charlie and she agrees. She sits down with me, hugs me, touches my face lovingly, apologizing for what happened to my arm. My aunt was an amazing woman and I do love her very much. She calls JR again and tells him not to worry, she's going to pick up Charlie so I'll have my own entertainment and they can have their own time. He immediately goes into this rage, starts sputtering and cussing about how it's too complicated now, and he just wanted an intimate meeting with her, not a damn family reunion. He went on and on about how he wouldn't want to have to babysit a 13-year-old kid and her 14-year-old boyfriend. He then hangs My aunt hangs up the phone and then tells me what happened, and we go about our night with pizza rolls and PlayStation, and everything seems fine. He calls her a few more times, 
drives by the house for a couple of weeks after, but my aunt was having none of it. After a while, he left our lives just as swiftly as he come in. The whole affair lasted only a month, if that. Three weeks, maybe all in all. It really wasn't the crazy experience she's ever had, so it was soon forgotten, and we all went back to our own business. Fast forward two years later, I'm almost out of middle school. My aunt had moved to a city about 40 miles away. I'm still living with my grandparents. They were still strict, but as they'd gotten older, so had I. I knew a few ways around their rules. One day, my friend Frank and I missed the bus home from school. I called our good high school friend Darla to come pick us up and take us home after riding around for a bit. She has this big, beautiful red truck, and I would ride around in the cab, loving the freedom of the wind. We were smoking cigarettes and laughing and listening to the radio. The time I would have spent on the bus before my stop was just enough time to hit up Taco Bell. We cruised down the road a little bit, heading back to Frank and I's separate houses. He lived just down the road. She dropped me off first. My grandparents came outside. They were heavily confused at the sight of an unknown vehicle, even more so when they saw that I gotten out of it. After letting her be the one to explain that she was older, cooler, and more responsible, my grandparents thanked her for being kind enough to take me home, and they said how lucky I was that she happened to be there just to help me get back. That was the last time we ever saw my friend. She didn't show up for work for five days, and I can't speak for everyone, but I just assumed that she'd run away. Darla's parents were going through a nasty divorce. The dad had a new girlfriend, and the mother was very bitter about it. Rightfully so, I guess. It was embarrassing for all the kids. Her truck wasn't left behind. I figured she got tired of her parents acting like infants and just took off. I missed her, but she was a whole other league of freedom and coolness. 16 is a whole different life than 14, especially when you're in different schools. I wished her, well, maybe even a little envious that she got out of this town and I was still here. I hadn't heard anything for two weeks about her, when about 9 p.m. at night, my grandparents got a phone call to turn on the news. Darla's body was found out in the woods. She'd been strangled to death and just left out there. I don't even know for how long. I was completely devastated. I was so joyful that I had my last experience with her, but so saddened and horrified. She was so young, barely older than myself. She was about to be 17 in just a short time. This was a very sad time for our entire town. The good and bad news is they caught the guy who'd done it. He confessed after having some very incriminating evidence, and during his questioning also confessed to killing his girlfriend, who'd been missing for about eight years, and also his father, staging his death that looked like a suicide by hanging. When they showed his mugshot on the screen and said his name, I swear I almost passed out. There, clear as day on the screen staring back at me was a picture of JR. I had no idea they even knew each other. I can't even imagine what would have happened if we'd gone under that bridge that night with him. Investigation Discovery Channel did a piece on it a couple of years back. I was shocked to see it on the TV. Those memories came rushing back and I decided to write them all down. I literally have a newfound appreciation of life now that I'm old enough to understand just how close I could have come to being killed as well. My aunt lived on to make some new awesome memories with me. I have a beautiful life with my husband and my three boys, and all of this wouldn't have happened if things had gone differently that night. During the late afternoon of April 22 in 1974, 20-year-old Stanley Walker and his 18-year-old co-worker Michelle Ansley were finishing up their shift at the Hi-Fi shop in Ogden, Utah. Stanley was just about to lock up the door when four men walked inside, but before he had a chance to tell them the store was closed, one of the men pointed a gun at his face. He and Michelle were marched down into the store's basement by one of the robbers, who then bound their wrists and ankles to prevent them from raising the alarm. The four men then set about robbing the hi-fi store, loading each piece of expensive audio equipment into one of the two waiting vans. Around 10 to 15 minutes later, 16-year-old Courtney Nesbitt walked into the store's open door in search of Stanley Walker. 
Stan had allowed him to park in the store's lot while he ran an errand, and Courtney wished to thank him for it. But instead of Stan, he came face to face with four armed robbers, who dragged him into the basement and took him hostage as well. The robbers tried to finish the task as quickly as possible, but the presence of three hostages meant they needed to be guarded, and the job was taking longer than they expected. Passers-by were growing visibly suspicious, and their plan was falling apart. Just as the last few pieces of audio equipment were being loaded into the van, Stanley Walker's 43-year-old father walked into the hi-fi shop. His appearance suddenly alarmed all four robbers who were forced to take another stranger prisoner. But whilst he was being detained, yet another person showed up to the store. Much like Warren Walker, Carol Nesbitt had arrived looking for her missing child. She was soon reunited with Courtney in the basement. It must have made for a terrifying reunion for the prisoners, but since their captors were quite clearly robbing the store, their lives would surely be spared if they remained silent and compliant. Once the robbers had gutted the store stockroom, two of them entered the basement to deal with the hostages. One of the men was carrying a bottle wrapped in brown paper bag, and after telling them it contained a mix of vodka and sleeping pills, he began to force feed it to the prisoners. Stanley Walker complied at first, wanting nothing more than to get through the ordeal alive. But it quickly became obvious that it wasn't vodka that he was being forced to drink. It was a highly corrosive chemical drain cleaner. Stanley screamed as his lips began to blister, his entire upper body burning as the fluid flowed through his stomach. Michelle Ainsley was next. She begged for her life, but was still forced to drink. The whole process continued, with each prisoner being force-fed drain cleaner before the robbers tied duct tape to their mouth. The goal was to dampen their screams of agony but the pus that leaked from the blisters on their lips prevented the tape from sticking. Faced with five writhing bodies in front of him, each racked with unimaginable pain, one of the robbers produced a pistol and began to execute the captives. Carol and Courtney Nesbitt were shot first, both in the back of the head. Courtney somehow survived the wound. His mother sadly did not. Stan Walker was then fatally shot in the head, but the bullet aimed at his father merely grazed the back of his. Orrin was stunned, bleeding, but somehow conscious. He knew well enough to play dead, but what came next must have severely tested his will to survive. The only prisoner who hadn't been shot was 18-year-old Michelle Ainsley, yet it was no mercy. Her suffering had yet to conclude. She was then forced to strip, before one of the robbers violated her brutally for around 30 minutes. When he was done, Michelle asked to use the bathroom. The robber watched as she did her business, then grabbed her by the hair and dragged her back into the basement and shot her in the back of the head. Orrin Walker, who was still playing dead at this point, later claimed her final words were a wail of, I'm too young to die, before the gunshot rang out. No matter how hard Orrin tried to play dead, Nothing could prevent him from flinching at the sound of Michelle's execution. One of the robbers then walked over to him, wrapped a wire around his neck, and began to strangle him. Orrin tried to fight for his life, but another of the robbers joined the fray, and they managed to pin him to the ground. A ballpoint pen was inserted into his ear, held steady, then stamped on. The pen tore through Orrin's eardrum, broke in two, then punctured his throat. The robbers then left Orrin bleeding to death and escaped with their haul of hi-fi systems. Three hours later, Stanley Orrin's mother drove over to the store to look for her husband and her son. She was accompanied by Stan's brother, who broke down the basement door while she called 911. The scene that greeted him was something like out of a horror movie. The basement floor was a cocktail of coagulate. The dead lay still and the dying groaned. As first responders began arriving at the scene, they were joined by a rabble of news-hungry TV journalists, and it wasn't long before the word of the slaughter flooded the airwaves. A few hours after the news broke, Ogden police received a tip from a serving member of the United States Air Force. The anonymous airman informed one of them that his comrades had recently remarked, 
One of these days, I'm going to rob that hi-fi shop. And if anyone gets in the way, I'm going to kill them. Around the same time the cops received their anonymous tip, two teenage boys were dumpster diving near Hill Air Force Base, just a few miles south of the Ogden crime scene. As they ransacked the dumpster for anything of value to them, they pulled out a small bag containing several wallets and purses. Upon a closer inspection, they were horrified to discover that each belonged to a victim of the Ogden Hi-Fi murders, having recognized their pictures from their driver's license. When he learned the evidence was found in the Air Force dumpsters, an Ogden homicide detective drove over to the base to address the airmen. He made a show of parading each piece of evidence before the assembly, while another detective carefully observed their reaction. Most of the airmen stood in somber silence, horrified by the detective's grim retelling of the cruel and needless slaughter. Yet two of them began to display some very suspicious behavior. These two men were identified as 21-year-old Dale Selby Pierre and 19-year-old William Andrews. Pierre had moved to Brooklyn from his native Trinidad at the age of 17 and had enlisted in the Air Force in September of 1973. At the time of the Hi-Fi murders, Pierre was out on bail for car theft and was the prime suspect in the murder as an Air Force sergeant. Upon securing a hasty search warrant for the two men's barracks, Police found flyers for the hi-fi shop along with a rental contract for a unit at a public storage facility. The detectives then tracked down the storage unit, cracked it open. They were greeted by the sight of the stolen hi-fi equipment and a half-empty bottle of Drano. With a collection of evidence in tow, Pierre, Andrews, and a third man named Keith Leon Roberts were charged with first-degree murder and aggravated robbery. Their joint trial began on October 15th of 1974. In the following month, Pierre and Andrews were convicted of all charges and sentenced to death, while Roberts received just five years for robbery. It emerged that an integral part of the Pierre and Andrews plan involved murdering anyone they encountered during the robbery, and they'd researched ways to kill quietly and quickly using poisons, gases, and or narcotics. The inspiration to use Drano had apparently come from the 1973 Clint Eastwood movie, Magnum Force, in which a prostitute drops dead after being forced to drink drain cleaner. At the trial, Oren Walker's testimony shook all of those who heard it to their core. He called Pierre a sadist and said he deserved to die young after saying, After he shot Mrs. Nesbitt first, then he was kind of prancing around and walking in a manner that I got the impression that he was kind of enjoying what he was doing. This has been hard for me. It's hard for me to believe that I was ever involved in this. My son Stanley's life was taken with two shots in Drano. He tried five different times to kill me. Each one would have been lethal. It's all certainly changed our lives. Walker said that his younger son, traumatized by his older brother's murder, slept on a mattress in his parents' bedroom and refused to go to the basement of the house. Most of my wife's time is spent in bed, trying to forget. While in prison, Dale Selby Pierre changed his name to a grand total of 27 times, supposedly trying to protect his family from any backlash. After being denied, he was executed by lethal injection on August 28th of 1987, at the age of 34. He declined a last meal, with his last words reportedly being, I'll be glad when this is over. 37-year-old William Andrews was executed on July 30th of 1992 after spending almost two decades on death row. His last meal was a banana split, which he shared with his niece and sister. Keith Roberts was discovered to have no knowledge of the murders, believing that he was simply a getaway driver. He was paroled on May 12th of 1987 after spending almost 13 years inside and moved back to Chandler, Oklahoma to live with relatives. Then, barely a week after William Andrews was executed, Roberts placed the barrel of a gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Stan Walker, Carol Nesbitt, and Michelle Ainsley all lost their lives during the Hi-Fi murders. Courtney Nesbitt was hospitalized for 266 days, and although doctors put his chances somewhere between slim and none, he managed to survive the whole ordeal albeit with irreparable brain damage. 
Orrin Walker survived with extensive burns to his mouth and chin, as well as the damage to his ear caused by that pin. The Hi-Fi murders remain so notorious that to this day, FBI trainees at Quantico Academy are taught all about them. They remain a classic example of how poorly planned and poorly executed crimes have a capacity to escalate, especially when a cold-blooded psychopath like Dale Selby Pierre has his finger on the trigger. America Online was a big thing when I was 13, or in other words, for my generation, AIM, which stood for, you guessed it, AOL Instant Messenger. It was around 2002. I would have been 13 and in 8th grade. I had many times went into chat rooms by myself or with friends just goofing around. Unfortunately, unsolicited photos were a thing then too, but usually you could stay clear of it by the chat room that you entered. I didn't have any photos of myself. And back when you had to take a digital photo and upload it from your camera. Plus, again, I was 13 and very self-conscious, which I'm sure anyone can relate to. But one day, a guy popped up on my screen wanting to chat with me. It went fine at first. I was very naive back then, and we quickly fell into a pattern of just talking. His name was Dave and lived in California. Eventually, he started telling me he loved me and all this, but the problem was... That he was 19. Now, I wasn't proud of this at first, but being 13, I sent pictures of some random girl and told him it was me. He instantly fell for me, telling me age is just a number and how mature I was. Now, at this point, he didn't live in state, so there was never any chance of meeting up. Eventually, he told me his mom and him were moving to the city that was about a half an hour away from me. He started begging me to come see him and to go to a movie anything. I had to break the catfish truth to him and tell him that those pictures were not of me, but of someone else. He was furious. He had been looking forward to a different type of child this whole time. He ended up forgiving me a few days later saying, I still want to meet you because I love you. All the things you say to a young girl to get to swoon her. I think back now and I'm like, wow, I was only 13. So I told my best friend everything. I just wanted her to go with me to meet this guy. The whole plan was him to drive to see me and then go to the movies to finally meet what I thought was the love of my life. I definitely had been brainwashed into believing that this was all very normal. I didn't tell my mom, of course, and honestly, she didn't notice anything was going on to begin with. So the day my friend and I were going to go meet up with Dave, her mom came and picked us up from school. And then she said something that made my stomach drop. She said, Chrissy... You are not going to the movies. You are not going to meet that man. You are going to get seriously hurt or kidnapped. I cannot allow you guys to go. I cried and cried because I honestly thought I could handle everything and be just fine. And then she actually told me she wasn't going to say anything to my mom. We just weren't going. I just had to promise to never speak to him again. And never... He ended up showing up and was super upset that I didn't show up myself. He went off the handle on AIM. It scared me. It scared me how close I was to this man or even being near him. I never ended up talking to Dave again, but I easily believe I would have been kidnapped or worse that day if my best friend's mom hadn't stepped in. My mom would have been none the wiser, and I none the wiser either. But here I am today, thankfully, and learned a dire lesson. The year was 1995 and I was 16 years old. I lived in a three bedroom, two bath house in a middle class suburban community with my mother and two younger brothers. And of course, our 140 pound Doberman Turbo. From the front door of our house, this is relevant. You can see directly into our living room which had an open concept floor plan with a kitchen and dining room. Our couch was on the wall directly in front of the front door. It was the summer between my sophomore and junior year in high school. My brothers and I had spent a decent amount of time outdoors because this was back when people still did that. I suppose anyone paying attention knew who lived in our house. And I also suppose 
They knew that the only adult was gone when the only car was gone. However, prior to the man showing up at the house, I never noticed anything off, and I never noticed anything afterward, so maybe we're just a random target. It was a Saturday, and my mom and the boys had run to the grocery store. In Nevada in the 90s, almost no one had air conditioning, so to cool off, you open up all the windows and doors and use fans. On this particular day, I had the back sliding door open and the front door wide open to get a cross breeze. Neither screen door was locked. I was napping on the couch in full view of the front door in shorts and a tank top. With unlocked doors, it's good we gain intelligence with age. In my defense, there was 140 pounds of protection on the floor right next to me. And probably, only for that reason, I'm alive to tell you this. Around the approximate time I expected my family home from the store, Turbo began barking. Assuming he was barking at their arrival, I told him to shush and try to go back to sleep. Turbo, God bless his sweet protective soul, continued to bark, becoming more and more intense and even aggressive with his barking. Finally, after five to ten minutes or so, Turbo refused to go quiet, and my family never coming in from the car, I sat up, realizing that something was wrong. A man who I didn't know stood seemingly frozen, staring at my frenzied and barking Doberman. Assuming that the man had some appropriate business at my home, I hurried to this ten steps to the unlocked screen door, constantly shushing Turbo. I apologized for my dog and for not hearing his knock. He never knocked. The man explained that he was from the phone company. He was here to check our lines. This entire time, he never took his eyes off Turbo, and Turbo never stopped snarling. I leaned forward far enough to see the street. Only unmarked, privately owned cars lined it. I looked at the man, who was dressed in tennis shoes, jeans, and a t-shirt. I was 16 and dumb enough to nap in front of an unlocked door, but I was no fool. Phone company personnel A always wear some kind of uniform, B drive some kind of company vehicle, and C don't come without being called, and D don't work on weekends. I looked at the man, who had yet to look up for my 140 pound dog that was now foaming at the mouth. I grasped the screen door handle and held it. This got his attention. He met my eyes as I said, You have 30 seconds to show me some kind of identification or I'm opening this door. I don't even think he made an incoherent excuse as he ran away. I fell to my knees and hugged Turbo. Then I gave him all the meat in the fridge. I believe with absolute certainty that I would have been attacked if we hadn't had him. I'd like to think that if I hadn't had a huge, overly protective dog, I would be in the habit of locking doors, but... What would be a screen door latch do against an intruder? And that creep stood there and watched me for five to ten minutes. Perhaps maybe he was paralyzed in fear, but maybe he was working his angles and only Turbo's insistent display of willingness to kill anyone who threatened me changed his mind. That's just my theory. Turbo has long passed, but his legacy lives on and two loving, loyal, and lethal, when necessary, dogs sleep with me still every single night. On the afternoon of June 1st, 1984, seven-year-old Mark Tildesley rode his bike down to his local candy store in a small hometown of Wokingham, England. The store's proprietor, Margaret Hickman, was very familiar with the boy, as he often spent his small weekly allowances there. Every time Mark visited, he would pay with three ten-pence pieces, given to him by his parents. But on the afternoon of June 1st, he paid with a single fifty-pence coin. Margaret thought this was unusual, yet simply assumed that Mark's allowance had been raised and sold him his candy. A few hours later, at around 5.30 p.m., Mark once again set off from his home on his prized Riley Tomahawk. He told his parents he was headed for the Frank Ayers Fun Fair, which visited Wokingham three to four times a year. Mark promised to be home by 7.30 that evening, calling out, Don't worry, Mom, I won't be late. 
as he pedaled out of the driveway onto the lane outside. But when 7.30 came and went, and Mark failed to return, his parents began to worry. At around 8 p.m., Mark's parents drove over to the fun fair to look for him. His bicycle was chained to the railings outside the entrance to the fairground, confirming that he'd been there. But inside, Mark was nowhere to be seen. His parents spent the better part of an hour searching that fairground, going stall to stall, calling out his name, but to no avail. Finally, just before 10 p.m. that night, Mark's parents contacted law enforcement to report him missing. Their eldest daughter and her husband were joined by numerous friends and neighbors for an overnight search party. But sadly, Mark could not be located. The following morning, the Ames Valley Police put together a full search and rescue team and began to scour the area surrounding the fairground. While ground teams employed more primitive methods, a dedicated search and rescue helicopter utilized cutting-edge heat-seeking cameras to scan the nearby woods and parkland. But again, no trace of Mark could be found. The following weekend, over a hundred Royal Engineers joined the search effort, bringing up police officers to question everyone present at the fun fair on the day in question. The search carried on for another week, but by the end of it, law enforcement was forced to admit that they had no idea how Mark had disappeared. <laughs> to force a break in the case, a national appeal was launched shortly before the one year anniversary of Mark's disappearance. The nationally syndicated TV show Crime Watch agreed to platform Mark's case, with their reconstruction watched by hundreds of thousands in June of 1985. The appeal generated several false leads, yet one caller's tip included a description which police found chillingly familiar. The caller described an elder with a crooked back who was dragging a boy fitting Mark's description away from the playground. In her statement, she referred to the individual as a stooping man and when one high-ranking detective learned of this, he made an astute but horrifying connection. The detective spoke of a man named Sidney Cook, who had been suspected of using drugs to facilitate the molestation of young boys. However, due to his suspected crimes having very little evidence or reliable witnesses, no formal charges had ever been brought against him. The fact that Cook lived just an hour's drive away made him an obvious suspect but this wasn't what drew detectives' suspicions. Their suspect had been nicknamed the Stooping Man, and given that he'd begun to suffer back problems as he entered his late 50s, Sidney Cook walked with a stoop. For political reasons, the investigation into Mark's disappearance dragged on for years and years. The case was hideously understaffed due to budget cuts and national strike action, with key officers needing to be diverted elsewhere. This meant that Mark's case wasn't revisited until the winter of 1989, by which time Sidney Cook was serving a 15-year sentence for manslaughter of a 14-year-old Jason Swift. Swift had been lured into Cook's apartment in the London borough of Hackney, under the pretense of there being a party. There, a group of men drugged, molested, and eventually suffocated the boy in what amounted to a harrowingly venal act of group violation. Since Cook didn't intend for his victim to die, he received a lesser sentence of manslaughter, but the presiding judge ensured the maximum prison sentence was given on the account of his unspeakable depravity. For all intent and purpose, Cook was right where the cops wanted him. The only trouble was, he stonewalled every officer who attempted to question him, at least until the winter of 89, when he was officially linked to the murder of Mark Tittlesley. In mid-November of 1989, London's Metropolitan Police launched Operation Orchid. Their objective was to close several missing persons case involving young children, Mark being one of them. During the course of their investigation, detectives questioned 36-year-old convicted pedophile Les Bailey. Bailey was considered an accomplice of Sidney Cook's and had been present at the death of young Jason Swift. Therefore, it stood to reason that if the stooping man had taken Mark, then Bailey either knew about it or was personally involved. Detectives subjected him to periods of heavy interrogation, alternating between offers of reduced or extended prison time. They appealed to his deepest fears, to his conscience, using every interrogation trick in the book, and in the end, Bailey cracked. He gave the detectives a small folded-up piece of paper, 
claiming that it had been in a cell for quite some time. When the detectives unfolded it, they discovered that it was a map, a map of which showed the location of Mark's murder. The detectives recommended that Bailey tell them everything that he knew about Mark's fate, as possession of the map already implicated him in a very serious crime. And with that, the truth came spilling out. Bailey confessed to being a member of a large underground pedophile ring, who nicknamed themselves the Dirty Dozen. It was them who had abducted and murdered Mark back in May of 1984. Sidney Cook had been the linchpin of the despicable scheme. It was him that gave Mark that 50 pence piece on that day he disappeared. During the exchange, Cook invited Mark to join him at the Frank Ayers Fun Fair that evening and promised to pay for him to ride the Dodgem cars. But when Mark arrived, Cook had other plans in mind. Bailey recalled how Cook had invited him to a party before instructing him to drive from Hackney to Wokingham with a mutual friend named Lenny Smith. Upon their arrival at a secluded parking lot, picked out by Cook, he appeared from some nearby bushes, dragging little Mark behind him. Mark kicked and screamed as he was forced into the back of the car, but was easily overpowered by Cook and his friends. When the group arrived at Cook's caravan, they found a man already waiting for them, an individual named Oddbod. Oddbod is obviously not the man's real name, rather a nickname given to him by his cousin, Sidney Cook. He was an active participant in the horror that followed Mark's arrival at that caravan, but didn't do a single day in prison for those crimes. You see, Oddbod was later deemed to have the mental age of an eight-year-old, and under British law, such a mental deficiency means a person cannot be held responsible for their own actions. This meant that not only did the prosecution opt to not bring charges against him, but his identity was kept a closely guarded secret. Once Mark was out of the car and inside the caravan, the men set about trying to calm him down. Sidney gave the boy a glass of milk, but after a few sips, Mark handed it back while complaining that it tasted funny. Minutes later, the boy was slipping into unconsciousness, a result of the heavy dose of muscle relaxants Cook had slipped into the milk. After that, the abuse began in earnest. Yeah. Seven-year-old Mark Tittlesley was essentially violated until he died, with a coroner who examined his body, estimating that he'd been dead for at least 30 minutes before the abuse concluded. Les Bailey claimed to have suspected that something was wrong, as he knew firsthand that children dosed with muscle relaxants weren't supposed to stay unconscious for that long. However, Cook assured him that Mark was fine. He'd be returned to the fun fair with no memory of the evening's events. But Bailey knew he was dead. And so did Smith. On October 18th of 1991, Les Bailey was officially charged with the murder of Mark. His trial was one of the most judicially unusual in British history for two main reasons. Firstly, and for reasons I'll come to explain, Sidney Cook was not charged with Mark's murder, despite being publicly named as Bailey's accomplice. And secondly, Les Bailey instructed his defense barrister to seek the maximum sentence possible, as opposed to the lesser one. He refused to say why he wished to be given more prison time, only that he was surprised and disappointed that Sidney Cook wasn't being charged. The following year, Bailey pled guilty to manslaughter, but was given two life sentences, way above the usual maximum of 10 years. When reached for comment, Mark Tittlesley's mother, Lavinia, expressed a deep disappointment in the verdict, adding that they should all hang. Just as law enforcement had their first suspected Sidney Cook, he refused to answer any of their questions regarding Mark Tittlesley's death. Although a key ring identical to one Mark owned was found in his car in late 1985, no formal charges were brought against him. It was the view of Britain's Crown Prosecution Service that Les Bailey's confession was simply not enough evidence to properly secure a conviction. And since Cook was already in prison for manslaughter of Jason Swift, they had ample time to let the evidence stack up. Since then, Cook has dropped hints that he knows the location of Mark's body, but refuses to tell the police or the boy's family, most likely to rob them of any tangible closure. On October 7th of 1993, Les Bailey was murdered by two of his fellow inmates at Wandsworth Prison in southwest London. One man distracted him while the other crept up behind him with a piece of cord. He died in agony, 
and it's believed that he was targeted due to his involvement in Mark's death. Lavinia and John Tiddlesley openly celebrated his murder, with the latter giving a harrowing statement to the journalist of National Newspaper. I've heard whispers that other prisoners didn't like him because of the awful crime he committed, and I think he got his just deserves. People hated him for murdering my son, and I found out who strangled him. If I could, I'd shake his hand. Lenny Smith also denied any role in Mark's murder and avoided prosecution on the same grounds as Sidney Cook. But in 2006, it was announced that he passed away after a painful and protracted battle with AIDS. Mark's parents once again celebrated the news, saying they only wish it happened sooner. Oddbod, on the other hand, his fate remains a mystery. There's a chance he was taken into the care of the state and spent the remainder of his life under the watchful supervision of various psychiatric nurses. But only a select few have any idea where that might be. In 2019, Mark's parents reached out to Sidney Cook one last time and begged him to reveal the location of their son's body. Once again, he refused. Cook was 92 at the time and is still alive in prison at the time of writing. His death is imminent and most likely He'll take the secret of Mark's final resting place to his own grave. It constitutes a gutless final attempt by Sidney Cook to claim ownership over Mark, a final insult to his heartbroken parents, and an indicator of what a monster he truly is. I've told this story to several friends, family, and even co-workers, partly to tell a weird experience that I had in the forest and partly to see if I could get some insight into what I actually experienced that night. I'm also interested in hearing from people reading this, what they might think had actually happened. I even have photos of the area and I'm hoping to attach them to the post. I'm originally from northwestern Ontario and have been and out in the forest my entire life. I grew up hunting, fishing, camping, and have gone on many remote backpacking canoe trips. I've also worked in the forest for a few different jobs. I've always felt very comfortable in the forest and have never had even one bad experience until now. And that was until working in the forest near New Lisquiered, Ontario. I was working in the district of the North Bay. As an ecologist, I've had many different jobs that brought me to every end of the district. One of those jobs involved conducting inventory on old logging cut blocks. This is something that I've done multiple times over in multiple different summers in different areas of that province. This particular block was located west of New Lascard, about a 45 minute drive out of town. The area was very rural with farm fields and the odd farmhouse scattered throughout. While driving the roads, it was common for other vehicles to stop and just stare at you. This might be because we were driving in a marked truck or that we were the only people that locals didn't recognize. The block we were looking for hadn't been cut since 1995 and was located down this old, rarely used logging road. The two of us were tasked with collecting data on the block. To get to that block, we had to turn off on this overgrown road that barely even fit a truck on. The road had many pits that nearly sunk our truck at multiple locations. When we couldn't drive any further, we had to walk the rest of the way to the block, which took around a half an hour. The work started the same day as any other. While we worked, we talked about office drama, funny experience we've had, and what good movies we'd watched recently. As we got further into the block, I started to feel my chest get tighter. As we continued, I started feeling like we were being watched through the trees. These feelings got stronger the further we traveled onto that logging block. I tried to shrug them off until my co-worker suddenly stopped, reciting the data we were collecting, then looked at me and said, I have a terrible feeling about this place. We then discovered that we both had been feeling like we were being watched and that something wasn't right about this area of the forest. We continued with the work and unsettling feelings persisted. As we continued further into the cut block, keeping our conversation, we suddenly stopped dead in our tracks, dropping the last word that was uttered. 
We both heard what sounded like two people having a conversation. This we couldn't comprehend because we were in a remote area. Deep down, this was almost undrivable trail on which we saw no sign of anybody else. Then another hour walk into the bush to get to the location. The forest was too thick to be any use recreationally, and it was not hunting season. What was also troubling was we couldn't make out what was being said. The voices would continue for a few seconds, then disappear as quickly as they started. Once they stopped, we would continue our work, but be stopped in our tracks as soon as the voices would pick up a few minutes later. This pattern continued until we came across trees that had been bent over and snapped. Now, it's not uncommon to find trees bent or snapped from bears or moose or even the weather. But what was odd about these trees was the proximity to the other trees. We would find a tight cluster of trees with the middle tree snapped and the others untouched. The trees were also free of any rub marks or scarring. Then, we came across a patch of young poplar trees that was completely surrounded by an almost perfect circle of dense spruce and pine trees. Within the patch, almost all the poplar trees had been snapped and bent down in different directions, but the surrounding evergreens were untouched. Neither of us had ever seen anything like this before, and with the feeling that something was watching us, we quickly got out of that area. As we moved back out of the block, the voices stopped, and the feeling of dread and being watched drifted away. We both expressed that it felt normal again, when we were only a half an hour a walk away from what we had just experienced. I've shown different foresters the photos looking for an explanation, but never received a clear answer. The best I received was, maybe the soil composition is different in that location. But all expressed how they never had seen trees broken like that. I've asked First Nation individuals from different communities, and been told by multiple people that what I experienced was a bad omen that shouldn't be talked about. Now that I type it out, I'm starting to have second thoughts about whether this is a good idea or not. What made me decide to post this was partly seeing other weird experiences in the forest, but also learning that two women had disappeared in that area. Julie Diane Fortier lived in Elk Lake, Ontario, went missing in 1980 after taking the bus to school. Five years to the day, she disappeared. Her school bag, running shoes, and coat were found near the Haleybury, Ontario landfill. The landfill is located roughly six kilometers of where she was supposed to be attending school and roughly 50 kilometers away from Elk Lake. Another five years pass before her remains are found by a couple along a dirt road outside of Haleybury. Many speculate on what happened to her, but the mystery itself was never solved. Melanie Ethier was missing from Newlyscard in 1996 when she went on a walk from home to her friend's house. She was observed walking by multiple people on this walk home and seen crossing the Armstrong Street Bridge near her home. The last stretch of her journey involved a poorly lit back road where she disappeared without a trace. To this day, Melanie's whereabouts are completely unknown. I'm open to ideas on what I experienced in the forest of Northern Ontario. My job continues to involve me slogging through remote areas of Canada. To this day, I have never felt the way I did in the forest near Newlisgard, Ontario. I just got off work. Today, I work 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. Around 10.45, a man walked in. I've previously had odd encounters with this guy, such as seeing him walk by me around my neighborhood and him hanging out near my street. I brushed those off since I live right next to where I work. Figured he lived close by as well, but always just kept my eye on him. So anyway, the man comes in, orders his usual pastry, and tells me, I'm going to stay inside and eat this. For anyone who doesn't know, my country is currently under lockdown because of the coronavirus, and all dining indoors is strictly prohibited. Not to mention my bakery is tiny, and there's never been any tables to sit inside, only a coffee bar that has never had space to sit. 
So I tell him, hey, we're on lockdown. You can't really eat inside. His response chills me. Are you alone here? Yes, I stupidly respond, but quickly try to catch myself. But my coworker will be here soon. A complete lie. It's only about 11 a.m., and my coworker isn't scheduled to be here until 1 p.m. when I'm off. Then no one will see me in here, he responds, and then goes back to eating his pastry at the coffee counter. I roll my eyes and just go back to work. I'm not getting paid enough to care if he quickly eats his pastry and leaves. 10 minutes pass, then 15. This guy is still inside. I look over. He's finished his pastry and is now moved closer to the open space in the counter that's meant for employees to walk back and forth between the front of the store and to the employees only side. Now I'm starting to get uncomfortable. I quickly text my coworker, a 30 year old man who owns a lot of guns and treats me like his sister. I text him 911. I look over again and now the man is even closer and is now quote unquote reading a book. He's put the book in front of his face and is peeking at me from above it, watching. Multiple customers come in during his stay. Every time I turn my back to him, he gets closer and closer and closer until eventually he is halfway in our employee only area. I begin frantically texting my coworker. He tells me he's four minutes away. I finally make the decision to text my boyfriend as well. I had avoided doing so to keep from scaring him until now because I was terrified. I sat in the back of the employee area watching this guy and I held a knife just in case he decided to come any closer. Just as he takes a step closer, my coworker bursts through the door. A confrontation ensues and the man leaves the shop but continues to sit in his parked car right out front and staring at me still. I tell my coworker about the previous experience and he's had enough. He marches out to the guy's car and tells him next time he comes around will be his last. My boyfriend pulls up at this point and joins in with the warnings. So Matthew, aka my stalker, let's not meet ever again. This story ended up being much longer than I originally anticipated, and I apologize for the long read. I will say, in all the years I've told this story, people usually respond this way. That is the craziest thing I've ever heard, so I hope you take the time and enjoy it as well. This occurred in the summer of 2008. I grew up in Oregon and was acquainted with the outdoors at an early age. My favorite hobby came to be hiking particularly in the areas that are either very dangerous or isolated. The health benefits of hiking were secondary to the thrills of walking the edges of exposed cliffs, being in cougar and bear territory, and knowing that I was far from help. Into the Wild was released in the fall of 2007. I immediately fell in love. Being a high school senior, I could barely go another week living in my parents' house. The movie spoke to my sense of adventure and inspired me to hike the California portion of the Pacific Crest Trail upon graduation. I made it from the Mexico border to Northern California without any incident. I saw a few rattlesnakes and black bears, experienced a little dehydration, but nothing that made me fear for my life. Somewhere in the Lassa National Forest in Northeastern California, I walked around a bend in the trail, only to be startled by two people sitting on a rock, dressed in nearly all white. Their faces were dirty, their appearance disheveled, and the man had a long, unkempt beard. Both seemed to be in their 40s. They looked like the couple who kidnapped Elizabeth Smart. What struck me as odd about the encounter was encountering anybody at all. I frequently went days without seeing a single human being. Their white clothes could be explained away by the need to escape the California summer sun. Their scruffy appearance could be explained away by the fact that most through hikers abandoned personal hygiene on the trail. After I say hello, they say nothing, just simply watch me as I passed. 
Even that I didn't find odd. I just chalked it up to them being foreign and not knowing what to say to me. I camped a few hundred yards off the trail that night, as I always did. Following bear precautions, I hung the leftover food I had cooked that night from a tree approximately five feet off the ground. Packing up camp in the morning, I noticed that food was no longer there. I immediately thought a bear had entered my campsite, so I began to look for paw prints. I didn't find paw prints, but I did find boot prints circling my campsite. Two pairs of them. One of those prints led right up to the rope which the food was hanging from. I immediately thought of the couple that I passed earlier, and everything clicked. I quickly packed up and left. My mind was racing the entire day. I figured maybe that couple was just simply hungry. If they had any nefarious intentions, they would have come for more than just the food, right? Several days passed. My mind was at ease again. I'd begun to circle my campsite with sticks to wake me in the event of an intruder, animal or otherwise. I awoke in my tent one night to the sound of those sticks crunching. I grabbed my hunting knife. I tried to relax by telling myself that in the middle of nowhere, the source of that noise could be much more likely an animal than a person. Then I hear frantic whispering. It was impossible to tell which direction the voices were coming from. Being in the dark surrounded by trees, a hundred miles from the nearest city, play some tricks on your senses. I debated on yelling out, claiming to have a gun, but instead decided to stay silent and retain the benefit of surprise. I heard footsteps circling my tent. I was ready to slash whatever opened it. But just like that, it was over. No more footsteps, no more whispering. I lied frozen awake in my tent until sunrise and then opened my tent to find nobody. The only evidence that something had actually happened were boot prints, same as the night before. Several more days passed. I was now in Shasta National Forest, probably 50 to 75 miles from where I first encountered the couple. The trail became more or less a goat trail, being on the side of a mountain and above the tree line. I could see the trail winding for miles in front of and behind me. I stopped for water in the rare shade, and noticed two hikers miles behind me. All I could see were two white dots moving along the mountainside, and I immediately said aloud to myself, fuck this, this trip is over. I pulled out my map and looked for the nearest town, which appeared to be Castella, located off I-5. The only problem was, it was 25 miles away. I hiked well into the night, trying to gain as much ground as possible. I kept losing the trail and decided to just set up camp, this time far off the trail and into the forest. I got in my tent, tried to sleep, but every little noise kept me wide awake. After a few hours in my tent, I heard the telltale signs of another bad night. The footsteps, the whispering, the sticks breaking. Sound travels far in the absence of any other sound. I knew that they were close, but wasn't sure how close. All I could think was this is really messed up. This is so messed up. Finally a flashlight hits my tent, lights up the entire thing, then goes dark. I unzip my tent, climbed out carrying my knife, yelling nonsense into the dark. It was sort of like that cliche scene in movies where people are in the wilderness, they hear sticks breaking around them and the camera pans around the trees because the people have no idea which direction the sound was actually coming from. Then I heard footsteps running toward the tent. I barely made out a figure moving in my peripheral vision. I just turned and ran deep into the forest. I tripped several times and ran into several trees. After running for approximately five minutes, I tripped, rolled, and came to rest next to a downed tree. I got under the tree trunk and laid completely still. I saw the flashlight moving around in the distance. I laid under that tree for hours and hours. I was certain they were gone, but I still didn't move. Eventually birds started chirping. I knew sunrise would come soon. Once it did, I made my way back to the trail, abandoned my campsite, and walked the rest of the distance to Castella, where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses I-5. I hitchhiked my way to the town of Mount Shasta, spoke with the police and forest service. 
They put me up in a motel for the night, and my parents drove from Oregon to pick me up the next day. I followed up with the police and Forest Service months later, who told me there had been similar reports of items disappearing from campsites throughout the surrounding national forest. However, there had been no other reports of terrorizing that I experienced. And as far as I know, nothing else ever came of that couple. A few years back, my girlfriend and I, having hiked several other parts of the Appalachian Trail, decided we wanted to give the southern portion of Virginia Trail a shot. It is about 166 miles long and runs through George Washington and Jefferson National Forests from Roanoke County to Parisburg and Giles County. This is definitely one of the more remote and less traveled parts of the trail, which is exactly what we were looking for. We gathered our gear and made our way to the start of the Virginia Creeper Trail to begin our journey. We had planned our journey to end at Damascus and figured that by that time when we got there, we would be more than ready to go home to our own beds. It was early October. The changing of the leaves and the colors were amazing. The air was crisp and cool. Perfect hiking weather with beautiful scenery. The majority of the trip was pretty uneventful. Just your typical hike. But our last couple of nights, that's where things got weird. On this portion of the trail, you're supposed to camp on the trail or designated shelter. We didn't really want to run into other people and didn't want anyone coming up on us in the middle of the night, so we decided to ignore those suggestions, find our own little spot right off the trail. So a little searching around and we find a spot just a little ways off the trail in the middle of this small clearing. It's perfect. We set up camp, cooked some food, then talked for a while, all to end up snuggled up and went to sleep for the night. Somewhere around 2 a.m., I was awoke by my girlfriend shaking me, telling me, Get your gun. Someone's outside walking around our tent. She informed me that she woke up to what sounded like someone right outside the tent, running a knife or something along the side, all while just circling us. While hiking, I carry a 1911 and a judge. You never know exactly who or what you might run into on such a long hike, especially in a remote location. I got the judge out of my pack, and we sat silently listening for any more sounds. A few minutes and nothing, but just the breeze blowing through the trees. Then I heard it. A snap, crunch, snap. Someone, or something, was walking in the woods right behind our tent. I got the flashlight and silently made my way out. Our fire had completely gone out, so it was nearly pitch black. Illuminated by only the dim glow of the October moon, I told my girlfriend to stay put while I checked it out. I didn't flick the flashlight on right away, so as to not give myself away that I was out of the tent and have it become a shining beacon of my location. Instead, I waited to hear more of those noises. After a few minutes, snap, crunch, crack. It sounded like it was bipedal based on the way the steps were paced. I turned on the flashlight and flooded the area with light. I thought I saw someone move behind a tree. I yelled out to them told them to go away now and that I was armed. I kept the light on the area with my gun drawn and slowly approached towards the area where I thought I saw that figure. Then, from my right, I hear what sounds like someone running away through the woods. I spin and face my light that way. Then from the original spot, who or whatever was, takes off into the woods. There's no way I was given chase, so I just returned back to the campsite. I tell my girlfriend all about what happened, and I end up sitting guard outside the tent, in the darkness, until daybreak. The next morning, I look around for bits or signs of who or whatever that was. I discovered a boot print and some moist dirt, not far off from our tent. Definitely wasn't mine, or my girl's. This freaked me out, as it definitely confirmed that someone, perhaps more than one, was skulking around our tent after dark. I kept it to myself because I didn't want to freak my girl out any more than she already was. So at this point, we were pretty deep in and still had two days left. That day, we walked a little faster than normal, covering as much ground as we possibly could. 
When it came time to set up camp, I found a spot near a cliff where we could place the tent in a small overhang and prevent anyone from coming up behind us. The whole day up until this point, I had a feeling that we were being followed. I had no confirmation of this. I hadn't seen or heard anyone, but it was just a gut feeling. We set up camp, made some food, then retreated back into the tent. I gave my girl the 1911. I kept the judge right next to me and assured her that if I slept at all, it would be with one eye open. After a while, she drifted off to sleep. I stayed awake listening to the sounds of the woods at night. I was awake for a few hours, just waiting to see if anything was actually going to happen. At some point, I guess my exhaustion caught up with me. I drifted off. I awoke sometime later, what sounded like someone going through our stuff outside of our tent. I grabbed my gun and woke up my girlfriend, shushing her telling her to be quiet. From the faint glow of the fire, I could see someone's silhouette against the tent. There really was someone out there this time. I yelled out to them something along the lines of, Hey, we are armed. Get the f*** out of here. They dropped what they were doing and just bolted. I came out of the tent, gun drawn and ready to shoot. All of our stuff was strewn all about. They had rummaged through quite a bit of it. I walked to the edge of the woods, in the direction whoever was out there had fled. There was a creek nearby. I walked to the edge where I thought there was a small trail running along the side of it. Down the creek, I could see a light. It looked like a lantern the way it flickered. Then, I saw three more emerge from the other side of the woods. I told my girlfriend to start packing up whatever she could and that we were leaving right now. We packed up everything of value, left the tent and a few other items and headed back onto the trail in the middle of the night. I kept hearing people talking off in the woods, hearing branches snap for quite some time. I kept looking back behind us every few seconds to make sure that no one was coming up on us. It was completely nerve wracking. If something happened, we were still a long ways from anywhere and quite literally on our own. We hadn't seen another hiker the entire time we'd been out there. I really felt like we were both in some serious danger. We'd been walking for quite some time when I heard something in the woods behind us. As we rounded a corner, I turned around and saw someone step out onto the trail and just stand there watching. It was just as the sun was coming up, barely any light. I couldn't make out any features, just silhouette. I stopped, looked at them for a second, and asked them who they were and what they wanted. They stood there, silently, watching, then turned and walked back into the woods. We picked up the pace and just kept going, looking back ever so often. We didn't see them again though, but again my gut told me that they were still there. Eventually we reached the trail and got to where we had parked my girlfriend's car, both extremely exhausted. We made it out of the Virginia woods without becoming a meal for the clan of cannibalistic inbred hillbillies, which is what I pictured happening in my head that whole time. I have no idea who they were, what they wanted. Maybe it was just someone messing with us. Maybe it really was a clan of deformed hillbillies who were hunting us. I'll never know because, well, for obvious reasons, I won't be returning to find out. This is a story that my father has told me multiple times. My dad, he's a logger, specifically one who operates a tree saw, which is basically a giant machine that is capable of cutting down massive trees and cutting them to specified lengths, which means he spends a lot of time alone in the deep forest. The way my dad's logging crew was set up is he would be told where he was supposed to cut down trees and he would go do that and be paid based on the amount of trees he cut down not how long it took him. So my dad used to work 16 to 20 hour days, constantly to get done as quick as possible. Then the rest of the crew would come up and clean the trees and ship them up to the mill. He would work 50% of the time all alone. The rest was with another tree saw operator named Rennie. They would use radios to communicate back and forth when they were working together. This is relevant for down the line in the story. 
So my dad and Rennie were put on a new job site, and we're 10 days in, everything was going as planned. They were constantly hearing weird chitter chatter over the radio, and it was such poor quality. No words could be heard or whatever radio channel they changed it to. It seemed to follow them. As they progressed through the job and went further up the mountains, those words from the radio would slowly become more audible. Both of them agreed based on small parts of the conversation that they could hear that something was wrong. They also began finding weird containers all over the place and signs that people had been there. People should not have been there. This was a two and a half hour drive up the mountain. They had to spend three weeks clearing out the road so their trucks and equipment could make it there. They come to the conclusion and the realization that they are in a very secluded area with people who shouldn't be there. And the worst part was, they aren't scheduled to leave for another week or so. They would only leave to refuel the truck with gasoline for the machines. They would buy supplies and sleep in campers. One day, Rennie comes across a tent and calls my dad over. They investigate that tent and find one lone sleeping bag with a duffel bag. Inside the duffel bag, they find many pairs of children's underwear, as well as a rope and duct tape, and sketched images of children being and photographs of children who appear to be unaware that they're being photographed. Inside that tent, they also find a small amount of food. They also found a small amount of food, which included canned goods and an apple, which proved that the tent had been occupied recently because there was no mold on that apple. Again, they are now on the mountain alone with, best case scenario, just a really messed up individual. Rennie instantly wants to get out, but my dad being the hardest working person ever, insists they would just need to finish the job and then they can leave. So they decide they will not talk over the radios unless it's an emergency, and then see if they can hear something else going on. They are now close enough in range of whoever has been talking to hear conversations between two men about collecting water and wood for the fire. Nothing abnormal, except for the fact that these guys don't belong here, and that tent was undoubtedly theirs. At the end of one of the work days, my dad hears them on the radio again, talking about one of them collecting brush for a fire. My dad hops on the radio, attempts to communicate with them about what they're doing. I believe he said, Who are you and what are you doing here? After this conversation, the men abruptly stopped and never picked back up again. That same night, Rennie wakes my dad up and whispers for him to get his gun. Someone's outside. So my dad has told me the first thing that he hears when he woke up is the quiet shuffling of feet outside. My dad fumbled for his gun. He finally found it, but realizes that he didn't even have it loaded and has next to little no clue where his rounds are located. Rennie has nothing and the thought of calling the police is absurd for multiple reasons. They hear a jiggle on the doorknob and it opens. The camper itself is far enough to the ground to where you had to jump in and there's no ladder or footstool. The door stays open. Neither my dad nor Rennie moved. They hear scratching right outside the door though. After four minutes of the scratching, my dad can no longer take it and just nods at Rennie. He gets up quietly walks towards the camper door. The second he reaches it, he is met with intense pain right across his right eye all the way to his left cheek. He's been cut and falls out of the camper hitting the ground hard. A man with a knife gets on top of him and is soon being kicked in the head by a man behind him as well. Rennie leaps out of the trailer and manages to get the man off my dad. My dad gets up and realizes that that second man without the knife is now running away and the man with the knife is scrambling away from Rennie and starts running alongside his accomplice. My dad and Rennie get into the truck and drive to the nearest hospital to treat my dad's cut and later report the events to the police. They both quit their jobs and two weeks later, as the rest of the logging crew was finishing up that job, one of them was found gagged, bound, murdered, and thrown into a ditch. As far as my dad's aware, no one was ever convicted of those crimes. To this day, my dad can still hardly see out of his right eye, and the pupil is disfigured and looks more like a cat's eye than a human. He suffers from massive PTSD from these events, hasn't slept a good night of sleep ever since.
I'm a 33 year old female from Los Angeles. Three years ago, my boyfriend and I, as planned for five years, turned 30, sold everything we owned, including my car, took his trailblazer, and decided to travel around the States and Canada. I guess you could call us backpackers as we tend to chase good weather, find a state park and backcountry hike into the wilderness for days at a time. My brother likes to joke that we are anti-establishment hippies. We don't necessarily live off the grid, but between the two of us, we have one prepaid phone that we use for emergencies and checking in with family and friends, and one MacBook, which I use for work. I'm a freelance writer, content creator, and I'm on retainer with Robotics Company. I mostly write boring white papers or web content. The whole point of our living situation is to live debt free and to have as few bills as possible. I only use free Wi-Fi, so one to two times a week we would go to a city with Starbucks. The background information is only important so you know who we are and how we simply live. Neither of us are involved in social media. We know very little of Reddit, Instagram, or use any other apps. So last summer, we decided to do some backcountry hiking in Arkansas. It's one of those states you don't really ever hear about other hikers visiting, but we read that it had some beautiful natural landscape. It does. The rules at this particular park were pretty lax. We didn't need a permit, there were few basic laws and guidelines, but there were no check-ins needed. We had all the basics and planned to do a six-day hike. Three in, three out. The whole time we were out there, we didn't see or hear another soul. But then one day, we were prepping to move off the trail, find a camping spot as it's getting near dusk. Half a mile off the trail is usually the standard for us. We took what looked like almost kind of like an animal trail, about a half a mile out. We saw this green two-person tent. It was almost camouflaged in the foliage, so we came on it, almost by accident. Some backpackers prefer privacy, others are more social. We are the more social type. We've had some great experiences camping near other backpackers, sharing stories, food in a joint or two. We were around 30 yards away from the tent. It was zip closed. So my boyfriend shouted a greeting to make our presence known. No movement, no sound. We assumed green tent guy was either not around or didn't want to be bothered. So we just started off in a new direction to get some distance between us. We camped. Never heard a beep. We move along the next morning, completely forgetting about Green Tent Guy, until nearing the end of day five on our trek back. We were again looking for a spot to camp off the trail, when we came upon that Green Tent again. This isn't that unusual, but normally, backcountry hikers keep moving, so we really weren't expecting to come upon it again. This time, however, the tent flap was open. So my boyfriend yells his greeting again. Nothing. My boyfriend wants to go check it out, saying, this is weird. Maybe someone's hurt. I didn't really like the idea from the get-go because even though we hadn't had any bad experiences personally, we heard enough stories from other backpackers about hermits and mountain men that want privacy, they carry guns, etc. My boyfriend assured me we'd be fine. If all else fails, offer him some weed and just keep the peace and we go on our way. As soon as we get within 20 yards of the place, we could smell the decomposition and it's intense. My boyfriend has been hailing his greeting over the last 20 yards. Once the smell hits him, he stops, turns to me and says, what if we find a dead body? My skin crawled. I was immediately afraid. I've never seen a dead body before and don't want to. The closer we got to the tent, the worse the smell got. I knew for sure we we're going to walk in and see some old campers rotting corpse. What we found was, well, worse. Outside the tent was a dead doe's legs, all four of them covered in flies. It looked like the legs had been cut most of the way, then ripped off the rest. It was a mess. Inside the tent, the body and the head of the deer. But the middle portion was swaddled in a blue fleece blanket. Blood was soaked at the bottom where the legs used to be. It was laying on its side, 
bottom facing the tent entry. The tail had been cut off. The anus and vagina was covered in dried blood and a gape. Like something had been penetrating it. Same with its mouth. The bottom portion was bent down at a scary broken looking angle. The tent was open, so we could see everything without actually having to go inside. Not that we would have anyway, because at this point, the smell was almost debilitating. There's a dirty, almost empty clear bottle of Jurgen's baby oil and a stained green white fringe kitchen towel. That was it. I immediately start crying and begged him to leave. All he could muster out was, what the f***? We turned and ran. We ran to the trail and jogged down it for as far as we could go until dusk was fully upon us and we had to set up camp. We didn't go very far and neither of us slept. We didn't start a fire or use headlamps even after full dark. We just sat up whispering to one another, going over and over what we had just seen. Every small or little noise startled us. Our brains were on red alert. I kept thinking any moment this weird, creepy dead deer rapist would come back to his tent, see our footprints or something, know we were there, and then track us back to ours. I've never been so scared in my entire life. Just before dawn, we tore down and started back out onto the trail. My boyfriend stopped at the ranger station on our way out of the park to report what we'd found. The ranger was a young guy around our age and he looked very freaked out by our story as we were telling it to him. He wrote it down. My boyfriend showed him on a map approximately where we'd been. He asked if we knew how the deer was killed, and at that point, we hadn't even thought about it. We just assumed it had been shot, but because of that blanket, we never saw a wound. But we weren't really exactly giving it an autopsy either. We have since shortened our backcountry hikes to a maximum of four days. We also have been a lot less eager to call out to other campsites, and we've never approached another unmanned tent since. The summer of 2008 was a rough time to graduate from college. I had just spent four years getting a degree only to find that the job market had all but dried up. As bummed out as I was about being unemployed for the foreseeable future, I found a deep appreciation for backcountry camping and hiking that summer. Growing up in the Rocky Mountains and graduating from college in western Montana, I was not a stranger to hiking or camping. But that summer, it became an escape to the point of an obsession. Going on daily hikes and camping beneath the stars really helped my mental health while I worried about my life's purpose and my future. It was June, and unseasonably cold, wet, and cloudy. The daytime highs barely touched 50 degrees, and at night, it dropped below freezing. Despite the weather, I had planned to hike around the Anaconda Range that week, and I wasn't going to let that deter me. My plan for the week, funny enough, was to hike from Storm Lake, over to Storm Lake Pass, and down to Upper Seymour Lake. Storm Lake is a challenge to get to and requires a 4x4 pickup and some skilled driving. The road is a narrow two-track winding its way through thick pine forest. The way was slick with rain, but I made it to the top with little heartburn. I set up camp on the north shore of the lake and decided to do some fishing. The fishing was miserable. It was cold and nothing was biting. The best thing about bad fishing is that my thoughts were free to wander while I sat on the shore. The rain was a constant light drizzle and created a natural white noise. Time passed and my daydreams were cut short as a low rumble from up the canyon overtook the sounds of the rain. The rumbling was not unlike a distant diesel engine. There are no roads that go beyond where I camped. No machinery or vehicles could be up that canyon. Maybe it's a plane, I thought, looking up into the rain clouds. But that sound wasn't getting closer or further away, and the sound wasn't really above me. It came from beyond the lake and up into the canyon. The sound was stationary and constant. This was most certainly not a plane or a truck or even a bulldozer. 
All of this wasn't outright scary, but nonetheless, my hair stood on end while I sat there just listening. After 20 minutes, the rumbling faded away, and I was left again with the only sound of raindrops. Soon enough, I caught a decent-sized trout and cleaned it, then headed back to camp to get ready for dinner. The fish cooked up fine, but to be honest, I hate trout. It's edible, sure, but totally unappetizing. They taste like mud. I ate as much as I could stand and then tossed the rest into the lake. Building up my fire for the night, I sat back to enjoy the evening with a little bit of whiskey. Night came fast. The mountain ridges put the sun to bed early, and the rain clouds obscured the starlight. It was dark, really dark. The sounds of crackling warm fire and the rain bouncing off my tent were a great comfort and started to lull me off to sleep. I reminded myself that I needed to build up the fire before bed. I walked over to my pile of scavenged firewood and grabbed an armful. Being away from the fire's crackling, I could pick up that all too familiar rumbling rising in the background. It was growing louder than before and closer. I may have had too many pulls of the whiskey and was tired and grouchy. This noise was ruining my camping trip and my buzz. Frustrated, I yelled into the blackness of the night. Hey! Shut the f*** up, asshole! Like a switch being flipped, the rumbling stopped. And so did the rain. My heart skipped a beat. I realized that, that was not a convenient coincidence. There is an intelligence out there. Something sentient. Observing me and responding to my screams. And I wasn't getting the most positive vibes from it. I threw all the logs onto the fire and then retreated back to my tent. More on edge than ever, I just sat there, listening. Listening to the fire crackling, to my rapid breathing, and beyond that, to the silence of the darkness. Before this moment, I had felt alone, but safe. Now, I felt alone and vulnerable. Beyond where the firelight faded, I felt like there was a million eyes that were just watching me. My paranoia began to subside when the rain started back suddenly again. Not a drizzle, but a massive downpour. I was glad I built up the fire, or it would have been snuffed out for sure. My tent was being pushed down by the force of that storm. I thought about bailing to the truck, but knew it would only be soaked to the bone instantly. Risking injury or death over getting wet is the kind of logic only whiskey can produce. I could feel the rainwater pooling and moving under my tent. The storm wasn't letting up. The urge to get in my pickup and drive away was never more tantalizing. I could get my stuff tomorrow in the daylight and spend a few nights in town. But I'd had way too much to drink. Driving, especially on that slick, muddy two-track road, would have been a death sentence. But I still needed a safer place to sleep than my wimpy tent. Grabbing what I could, I ripped open the tent flap and ran for my truck. I was soaking wet by the time I settled into the driver's seat and locked my door. Turning on the heat on full blast, I hoped that would dry me out. It was going to be a miserable night though. I reclined in my chair and tried to calm my thoughts with deep breaths. The rain still wasn't letting up. I was warm from the heater and I was riding the crest of a good whiskey buzz. The fire was still raging despite the rain and kept the campsite well lit. I remember the truck's clock reading 1.06 a.m. I blinked. It was only a moment, but when I opened my eyes, the rain had stopped. It was foggy and quiet. The once raging campfire was just embers, and there was morning twilight to the east. My truck's clock now read 5.45 a.m. It was morning. That couldn't be right. Almost five hours had gone in the blink of an eye. I must have passed out. My head was killing me. I didn't feel like I drank that much to justify that kind of hangover, though. I turned off my truck and stepped out to survey the night's damage. My tent was completely flattened. The tent poles were shattered to pieces. Everything was soaking wet. Smothering the remains of the fire, I dragged all my junk to the pickup and tossed it into my bed. My hike over the pass wasn't happening today, that was for sure. It was around 6.30am before I finished picking up camp. As I climbed into the cab of my truck, I heard the rumbling again through the morning fog. I drove out of there as fast as I could, down that muddy bobsled track of a road. 
not once looking in the rearview mirror. I have never been back to Storm Lake, and I probably never will. Last summer, my boyfriend and I went camping in some nature preserve in Pennsylvania. I can't remember the exact name, but it was pretty primitive camping. No cell service, and we only saw two other people there the entire time. It was huge, so it was pretty empty. My boyfriend pretty much immediately said that these two people seemed off to him right away. I don't know if they had anything to do with what happened that night, but I'll describe them. The first person was a woman who had her truck parked off the trail and hood open. I really don't notice these types of things, but my boyfriend said it looked to him like she was waiting for someone to pull off beside her and offer to help her with her truck. Normally, my boyfriend is the type to at least offer to call someone, but he said that she skeeved him out enough that he didn't want to draw attention any more than what was necessary. The next person we saw drove by there several times while we were setting up. He just kept driving by slowly and looking at us. Again, I really didn't notice, but my boyfriend pointed it out to me. This guy's already drove by twice. We're not sure if these people had anything to do with what sinister happened. The real story has to do with what happened and what woke us up at 3 a.m. All of a sudden, it was incredibly loud. I couldn't really describe it or even compare it to anything, but my boyfriend said it sounded similar to a chain gun revving up or something some kind of a large tool used to scrape gravel. He jumps up looks out the little window of the tent and hears that sound happening again and again and again. Each time it was getting noticeably closer. I was about to piss myself, but my boyfriend told me it had to be probably miles off. I didn't question this because loud noises can be heard from miles off, right? Well, later my boyfriend told me that he told me that because he didn't want to scare me. What it really sounded like was it was coming from right down that little dirt road that was right next to us. At one point, he said he suspected it was right in front of our campsite. The only reason he didn't tell me to get out and dart for the car was because he was afraid it could be someone trying to scare us and get us out of the tent for some unknown reason. He whispered for me to go back to sleep. However, I couldn't because every little sound I heard outside sounded like someone sneaking up to our tent. Eventually, my boyfriend told me to get out and help him pack. It was maybe 20 minutes after that sound had stopped. He held our only weapon, a machete right in front of him. It was a full moon or close to it, so we didn't really need a light. While we were packing him quickly, I noticed an empty beer can, now close to our dead campfire. It wasn't there when we went to sleep around 10 p.m., and neither of us had brought any beer with us. Thankfully, we got out of there, and for the rest of that trip, we either camped in areas well populated by other campers or got a hotel room. So whoever or whatever that was, it's not me. This story is about a bad experience I had when I went camping on the beach in the summer with my boyfriend. We had the nice idea of camping on the beach instead of going to a hotel, since I've always wanted to sleep and hear the waves hitting the shore, see the night sky, and just lived this experience at least once in my life. We were supposed to stay in that tent for a week. The area had public restrooms with showers and restaurants, so the matter of hygiene and hunger weren't an issue. We bought all the supplies we needed for such an adventure. A two-person tent, which was blacked out, so the sun rays wouldn't come in. An inflatable mattress, a first aid kit, lanterns for the tent, etc. The first nights, no issues. We actually enjoyed every single moment of it. We would always take all of our valuables with us into backpacks, just in case anything bad happened to our tent. We weren't the only people that camped in that area either. There were actually plenty of people that would camp there. Either single people, couples, or even families. Which included even people that behaved badly. When night came, you would occasionally hear people laughing, partying, dancing, listening to music, doing drugs, and drinking a lot of alcohol. We didn't really mind it. Nobody had bothered anyone for the past four days and night. People were just having fun as they knew best, and no one was being aggressive to that point. One of the nights we stayed out a little later than normal, around 1am, just wandering around the lively streets to listen to the street performers, 
eating and such. When we stopped at one of the street performers, who seemed to have a lot of people circling him, listening to his music, we realized he wasn't the main character the people were gathered for. In the middle of the crowded street, where cars would occasionally pass by, was this middle-aged woman dancing completely naked. Clearly affected by the abuse of alcohol and drugs, she was completely incoherent. She would randomly flirt with people. She would expose herself while dancing to the music. Despite the disgust of the musician and the passers-by, we really didn't look or think too much into it and decided to leave and head back to our tent. While drinking with ourselves, we hear some lady shouting in the distance. It's that same woman we'd seen earlier, but now she wasn't alone. She had a few friends with her. They were coming to camp on the same beach as us, the few tents further down. Not far enough that so we couldn't hear them or see them, even if it was dark. They lit a fire on the beach and continued to drink and smoke and dance around it. She, of course, was still naked, but this time she's wearing a see-through skirt. She goes in the ocean for what seems to be an eternity, and I remember thinking, how is she not cold? That water is freezing. My boyfriend and I shrug it off, and he said just to not be bothered by it. If we don't engage with her or them, they wouldn't annoy us. So we did just that. But even so, I always felt like we were being watched. Eventually, we put those thoughts aside and tried to get some sleep. But being a beautiful night and the warm air, we thought of not completely closing the tent. Just zip over the mosquito cover so the air would circulate inside the tent and then have the sun shine in the morning to wake us up early. I don't recall how long I'd been sleeping for, but I remember being awoken by the footsteps circling our tent and a womanly voice humming a song softly. The tent was not very thick, so you could obviously hear everything outside of it. I was too afraid to look out. I was even too afraid to even change my position as to not indicate to the outsider that I even noticed their presence. All I did was lay down and look outside through the mosquito cover. All of a sudden, I hear those footsteps stop above my head and the voice whispering, Don't be afraid. I only want to sing you a lullaby. The footsteps began again to circle the tent. I saw her feet in front of our tent, just passing by, and noticing the very familiar, long see-through skirt blowing behind her. The next morning, we packed up our tent and moved to a different area of the beach, further away from that woman and her friends. <laughs>